could speak. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll catch up. Catch up. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The panel is about to begin. You can speak from the seat or you can speak from the podium. Right, I will stand up there, probably. Okay. You want to sit down? Okay, yes. No, I think I may sit because the angle is bad. I have to see the screen. Oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please please take your seats. We're we're going to start the panel. We're running behind. Hello, I'm H. Sterling Burnett. Uh, I'm research fellow with the Heartland Institute and managing editor of Environment and Climate News and uh, Climate Change Weekly. I'm pleased to see so many of you here today and honored to be chair, uh, moderating this panel. Uh, the public is constantly barraged with the claim that the science is settled. And uh, this panel, if it does nothing else, hopefully, you know, most of you in here already know that it's not, but anyone who is not aware should be disabused of the notion that the science is settled. Um, since Donald Trump's election, scientists with a hysteric bent have been claiming he's going to be scrubbing data. He's going to be losing climate data. We've got to protect it. Uh, he's going to be slashing climate budgets, and thankfully he is actually doing that. But he's not getting rid of science, and that's what you'd uh, expect based on their hysteria. One of the things I always do, just as a uh, sort of a fun thing, when I hear the science is settled, when a, when a reporter tells me that, I say, then why are we continuing to fund climate science? Because if we know all we need to know, we don't need to keep pouring billions of dollars into it. It should be a, a small, you know, how much money do we spend on evolution? Well, that's how much the government should be spending on climate science if it's settled. Uh, you'll find out real quickly from the climate scientists doing the research that have been getting the government grants, it's not settled then. Suddenly, it's not settled. No, 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 we've got much more to do. Well, then it's not settled. Um, I'm honored to be here today because I get to be up with these august gentlemen. The first speaker, and this is the order they'll be in, a few housekeeping notes. Each speaker has 15 minutes. We have a timer out here who will be giving notice with signs when you have five minutes down to one minute. You have to wrap up because we have to stay on time. At the end of that time, we'll have 15 minutes for questions. I will recognize, you will raise your hand, I will recognize you, and Tim will bring a microphone over to you to ask your questions. So please speak into the mic because we're recording all this for posterity. Now our first speaker today is Fred Singer. What can you say about Dr. Fred Singer? Before he founded the Science and Environmental Policy Project, he was the first director of the National Weather Service and director of the Center for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Maryland. He's also co-author and editor of Hartler's own, Hartland's own series of books, Climate Change Reconsidered. And I don't know how many of you have read or seen these, but they're quite the tome. You know, each volume, hundreds of pages, peer-reviewed data that shows the science is not settled, but what we do know is that there's no reason for alarm. Fred is front and center on that. He is the foremost among the champions of a rational understanding of climate science and climate change. And among other things, he'll discuss the extent of the divergence between climate models and alarmist predictions, and the state of the evidence concerning the human impact on climate change. 
Our second speaker is Dr. Don Easterbrook. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with his work, but he's got a, a great uh, second volume book coming out. He's an Emeritus Professor of Geology at Western Washington University. He's contributing editor of the recently released Evidence-Based Climate Science, Data Opposing CO2 Emissions as the Primary Source of Global Warming. If you have, and I believe in your package, you have the most recent issue of Environment Climate News, there's a review of that book by our own Jay Lair in that uh, ECN. So I, I, I encourage you to read both the review, but also go out and get the book. It's, a, it's an amazing book. Don's presentation addresses why we can know carbon dioxide is not the cause of global warming. The third speaker on the panel, I've had the pleasure of knowing for a few years now, uh, more than a few years, going on 20, I think, Willie. Mm -hmm. um, astrophysicist and geoscientist, uh, Willie Soon. He is a leading authority on the relationship between solar activity and the Earth's climate. Now, the past couple of years, as you may know, have been uh, trying with Willie being under constant attack by climate alarmists. During this stressful time, Willie's carried on proclaiming scientific truths with dignity and humility. Willie's presentation addresses the truth about Arctic and climate change, about the Arctic and climate change, and I leave it uh, open with Fred now. Good morning. I hope you will forgive me for remaining in my seat. I have a little bit of difficulty moving around. First, I want to uh, dedicate my remarks to the memory of Bob, Professor Bob Walker, Bob Harper, uh, Bob Carter, sorry, uh, who passed away after he returned to Australia following the Paris meeting. I also want to thank Joe and Diane Bast for doing a magnificent job of editing the various volumes of the NIPCC, or as I call it, NIPIC, the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. I, today, I want to discuss the new things that I've learned and convince you of uh, the correctness of these remarks by presenting evidence, evidence, real evidence. The first slide shows an iconic graph that you will all recognize. It shows that the surface temperature of the 20th century, and immediately you recognize what many people consider to be two periods of warming. An initial period from 1910 to 1940. I can't see too well from here, but you see it. And, and then uh, a second warming. Now, the first warming is genuine. I want to convince you that the second warming does not really exist. It's fake. It's an artifact of the analysis. So I will convince, try to convince you of that. That's actually very simple. What I do is to compare these surface data with uh, other data that are available. The next slide shows some of those data. What is available shows that the initial warming in the early part of the century is matched by proxy data, the second warming, so-called warming, contradicts eight different, eight different data sets. Therefore, the second warming is not genuine. It's not really a fake, as I've called it. It's not faked. 
with a D at the end, it just <coughs> is an artifact of the analysis of the data. I will show you that uh, reasoning by evidence. Both ocean data and land data are poorly analyzed. But I bet you that this audience of mostly skeptics still believes that the second warming between 1975 and 2000 exists. It does not. It is not a global warming. The next slide. Yeah shows some of the different data sets that disagree with the second warming. The atmospheric data, ocean data, the, uh, the nighttime marine air temperature, uh, all disagree with, and the proxy data, all disagree with the second warming. You have eight different data sets including the solar data. They also disagree. The next slide. Yeah, shows the extreme temperatures. You see the extreme temperatures only existed in the 1930s. There are no extreme temperatures in, during the period of the, the so-called second warming. So extreme temperatures only exist in the early warming, which is genuine, but not caused by carbon dioxide. So the result is that there is no evidence of carbon dioxide causing any significant warming in the 20th century. None whatsoever. That is a result that I recognized early on, but I've been reluctant to put it forward because I didn't have enough evidence. Here is some of the evidence. First of all, about atmospheric warming, you see the th theoretical uh, calculations on the left and the actual observations on the right. They do not agree. This is published in a government report and is now well known. The so-called hotspot, which was assumed, uh, postulated by Ben Santa does not exist. Neither the balloon evidence nor the satellites show a warming trend in the tropical troposphere. The next slide shows the ocean data, the best ocean data we have by Goretsky and John Kennedy of the Hadley Center, you'll see hardly any warming in the latter part of the 20th century. So the ocean data do not support the so-called second warming. The next slide shows the, the nighttime marine air temperatures. Again, you'll see that the 90s are about the same temperature as the 1940s. Both in the tropics and globally. The expert on this subject is John Kennedy at the Hadley Center, who kindly made the data available to me. They're very difficult observations. Nighttime marine air temperature but it is the only genuine measurement of air temperature close to the ground over the ocean. 
The next slide. shows the, prox the first proxy data that I saw in 1996. These are tree ring data. They show the first warming. You see it between roughly 1900 and 1940. And then no warming in the latter part of the 20th century. Oops. Let's go back. Here we are. These are the proxy data. Now, what? No, I'm okay. Now, you see, this gave me the first inkling that the proxy data do not match this temperature data from the surface. That's 20 years ago, 21 years ago. And that was published 20 years ago in my first book on climate science, Hot or Cold Science. Next uh, shows the other set of data from Michael Mann, the famous hockey stick graph. And now I come to a subject of deception. Man has withheld his proxy data after 1979. I can't get them to publish it. You see why? It would destroy the blade of the hockey stick because there is no warming. And this illustrates the so-called nature trick that people have accused Michael Mann of. By the way, the accusation came from Phil Jones in England, who referred to Michael's, Michael Mann's nature trick. What Mann did is to withhold his proxy data and substitute uh, data from weather stations in order to get the blade of the hockey stick. That is pure deception. I have been trying to get him to publish his work, but he won't do it. Next slide. Shows more proxy data, all of which show no warming in the latter part of the 20th century. Next slide. This is uh, uh, published by Eike in Germany. Uh, it is the only NIPCC report that was not published by Heartland. Next slide. Next slide. This is from the first IPCC report published by Heartland. It shows something that's obvious, namely that the sun warms the top layer of the ocean during the day, but not at night. Why? Because the sun doesn't shine at night. We all know that. You see the warming? You know, if you mix the data together, and take into account the fact. Next slide. This is from the report. Next slide. You'll see that ocean buoys, which float at the top of the ocean, started to increase in 1980. And by, by 2000, they constituted about 60% of the data. Well, if you take that into account, of course you get a fictitious warming. It's entirely fictitious. It's an artifact of the analysis. 
Next slide shows the land data, and here you see what happened during the early, during the latter part of the 20th century. Suddenly, the number of stations dropped by something like 60%, and now most of the stations are at airports. Now, airports are notorious for being not only rural, but also having increasing temperatures. Why? Because air traffic increases roughly 5% per year. So on average, this change in the population of stations would give you a fictitious warming. And that is the reason why I believe we have a, a, a fictitious warming in the second part of the 20th century. It does not exist. Now the question is the third question. Why do we not see a warming from CO2? After all, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Next slide. You see, there's clearly no warming from CO2. The models all incorporate an increase of CO2. The data do not show it. Next slide. The answer is solar activity is the main cause of global warming. We'll hear more about this from uh, Willie soon. Next slide. How I became a skeptic. I, it took me a while, but gradually became to disbelieve in global warming from CO2, or any significant global warming from CO2. I, I will say this, I'm not a denialist. I'm not a lukewarmer either. I just want the, the evidence. One word about denial, denial varies from people who say there is no climate change, which obviously is silly. Of course there is climate change. To all the way to people who say denial, that's nothing but a big river in Africa. <laughs> well, that's true too. Next slide. Next final slide. Conclusions. This, the warming in the second half of the 20th century is fictitious. There is no evidence that I know of for warming, for climate warming from CO2. CO2, therefore, is not a pollutant uh, or not. To explain what, what CO2 does requires uh, some sophisticated analysis, which is still in progress. I'd be glad to discuss it with you. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. I'm going to be speaking from down here because I have to see the screen, and we can't see the screen from the stage. So otherwise, I'd be talking in the in the dark. But I can't see now. <laughs> <laughs> now you can't see. <laughs> no, <it's better. laughs> okay. Um, much of what I have to say has been published recently in a new Elsewhere book 
called uh, Evidence-Based Climate Science. And I'll be talking about carbon dioxide, talk a bit about uh, the oceans, a little bit about uh, solar interests on climate, and last, climate predictions. So if I can squeeze all that in in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I guess. So this, these are the topics. And I will tell you that carbon dioxide is not the cause of global warming. And I'll show you the evidence for that. I'll also talk a bit about the sun's influence, a bit about uh, a recurring pattern of climate changes that allows us to predict what's going to happen in the future. And at the end, I'll make a few comments perhaps on what needs to be done to, to restore uh, scientific integrity. So we're interested in evidence, and the evidence is very clear. So we want to test the concept that CO2 causes global warming. What we know is that CO2 emissions soared after 1945, post-World War II, at a, a very sharply increased rate. And any climate changes that occurred before 1945 can't be blamed on CO2, because it hadn't risen yet. And the test is that if global warming is caused by CO2, then temperature should correlate with CO2. So look what happened. Here we start to soar in 1945. Uh, this is the, these are, are global emissions, and superimposed on that is what the climate was doing. So for the first 30 years after the big sharp increase, we had 30 years of global cooling. So from this you could conclude that CO2 causes global cooling. And then there has been some warming since then. So climate change is real, nobody denies that. And let's look then at what CO2 has in, in common um, with temperature. Here's where, this is about 1945, this is where the emissions began to rise sharply, and we have 30 years of global cooling. And before that, from 1915 to 1945, we had global warming without any increase in CO2. So who needs CO2? And it gets even, even um, more than that. In this graph, I plotted temperatures from uh, isotopic evidence in ice cores. The red peaks are periods of global warming. And there are 20 on this graph, dating back to about 1500. If you go back even farther, if you go back 10,000 years, this is 10,000 years ago, this is the present, temperatures were about two and a half to five degrees warmer than present in Greenland no CO2. And then about 1,500 years ago, we dropped into uh, what has become uh, the Little Ice Age. Going back even farther, 25, 30 years, 1,000 years, we have the last ice age with huge warming of 20 degrees in less than a century and dropping of temperature of 20 degrees in uh, perhaps around a century and rising of temperature about 20 degrees in a century all without the benefit of CO2. Second line of evidence is that CO2 cannot cause significant global warming by itself, simply because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is minuscule. The atmosphere now consists of about 41 thousandths of 1% of CO2. So if you take 100 molecules of air out of this room, you'll have only four molecules of carbon. It's about as close to nothing as you can get. If you double nothing, you've still got nothing. Not only that, but CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It accounts to only about 3.6% of the greenhouse effect. 95% uh, is water vapor. And the really telling <laughs> argument is that since 1945, 1950, which is the period supposedly to be the one of global warming, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased by only eight one thousandths of one percent. If you take the level in 1950 
and the le absolute level, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, now it's increased by eight one thousandths of one percent. And that isn't going to do very much. Third line of evidence is that CO2 always lags global warming, so it cannot be the cause of global warming. We know that from ice cores. Uh, these are from um, the Antarctic ice sheet. The blue line here is temperature, and the yellow line is carbon dioxide. And notice that carbon dioxide always follows the rise in temperature. It always lags temperature. So CO2 cannot be causing the warming. And that's true of each ice age in the past. I've just shown one here. It's even true on a shorter term. Uh, here is temperature, the blue curve, and the green is carbon dioxide. So if you take the peak of temperature and the peak of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, even in the short term, always lags temperature. And Willie Soon has shown that there's no correlation at all between CO2 and temperature. This line right here is carbon dioxide. Here is warm temperature, here's cool temperature, um, and there's no, no correlation. So we can conclude from that that there have been many, many, many periods of global warming which could not have been caused by CO2. And if you add all these up, you can only get about one-tenth of one percent of global warming periods that correlate with CO2. Not very convincing. 99.9 percent .9 of geologic warming in the past uh, has been, uh, cannot have been caused by CO2. Or, um, so there's so little CO2 in the atmosphere that the conclusion is inescapable that carbon dioxide has no significant effect on global temperature. And it's also been shown that cutting carbon dioxide emissions will not change atmospheric CO2. You could spend a trillion dollars in 10 years, and the figures are that it would change temperature less than one-tenth of one degree. So if CO2 is not the cause, what is? And we can look at historic uh, temperatures, and we get warm periods and, and um, cool periods. Uh, this is a structure in Greenland um, about 1400 years ago, or 1400 AD, uh, when the climate there was warmer. And there's a direct correlation with sunspots. Sunspots are these dots around the sun discovered by Galileo in 1609, a closer view. Dark is cooler, and they're dipolar. They make big arcs, magnetic arcs, uh, between those points. So the first clue comes from the relationship between sunspots and climate that occurred during what's called a Maunder Minimum. For 50 years, from 1650 to about 1700, there were virtually no sunspots. And this is what happened to the climate. Uh, this is the temperature curve, uh, the red line from central England, and it shows that there was strong cooling. Glaciers advanced in the Alps, uh, the Thames froze over, they had pears there. And there's an interesting correlation between the number of sunspots, uh, this is the number of sunspots, each of these is a cold period. And so every time we have low sunspots, we get a cool period. The same is true with what's called TSI, total solar irradiance. Think of that as the energy coming from the sun in watts per uh, square meter. TSI shows the same thing. It follows the temperature. And on this graph, you see a temperature curve, and these are the, this is, the red line is the TSI. Again, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So how can this affect, possibly affect climate? Well, it may be that the uh, magnetic field of the sun has an effect on incoming radiation. Uh, many of you are familiar with what's called a Wilson <coughs> cloud chamber, where if you um, uh, have a, a situation where you have water vapor uh, and you allow um, just uh, radiation in the atmosphere to go through it, they, they leave contrails like a jet liner. And these are a function then of how many cosmic, how much cosmic radiation is coming to that, that particular place. When the sun has a low magnetic field strength, 
Think of the sun's magnetic field as a giant shield that's shielding the Earth from cosmic rays. When we have a low field strength, we have um, fewer sunspots, we have smaller uh, solar irradiance, and therefore we have, we have more galactic cosmic rays coming into the atmosphere, which is producing more clouds via the uh, Wilson cloud effect. That causes more sunlight to be reflected into space and the Earth becomes cooler. And the same is in the opposite direction. High solar field strength, more sunspots, more TSI, fewer cosmic rays, less cloud formation, less sunlight reflected, and in a warmer climate. And this is the data. I'm going to skip through this really quickly. I just want to show you this exists. You can find this in the reprints uh, of, the, um, of the Elsevier book. And if you, any of you want that, uh, you can just email me. Email me. I left some uh, outside on the, on the counters. But in, in, a, in a word, um, there's a direct correlation between sunspots and cosmic rays. So to, how can we check this? Well, we can look at the production of beryllium-10 and carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere because it is produced by cosmic radiation. More cosmic radiation, more beryllium-10, and more carbon-14. And here it is. Beryllium-10 is high. Uh, it corresponds well with sunspots. And if you plot the um, amount of beryllium-10, which is being produced by cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere, compare that to, uh, to temperature, look at the correlation. There's a direct <coughs> correlation. And uh, the same thing is true between beryllium-10 and radiocarbon. They show an amazingly similar record. So they reinforce one another, and um, th therefore we think it's probably correct. So the conclusion is that low solar magnetic fields increase cosmic radiation. That induces atmospheric condensation. that leads to increased cloudiness and cooler temperature. This is the hypothesis first um, uh, put forth by Heinrich Svensmark of, of Denmark, uh, and this is now the isotopic evidence that seems to confirm that idea. So how about the next 30 years? Well, in 1977, we're worrying about an ice age. 2008, need to be worried. Um, and so what can we expect? What we can do is to uh, look at some predicting methods. Uh, models don't work. Here's the model um, prediction. Here's where we actually are, big difference. But we can look into the past. The past is the key to the future. And we can, we can establish well-defined cyclical patterns of warming and cooling that allows us to project that pattern into the future. Um, I'll skip that one. And so here is a graph that shows glacier advance, glacier recession. In the North Pacific, we had cool water, warm water, cool water. And here's the global temperature, cooling, warming, cooling. So there's a direct correlation here between what's going on in the ocean waters and what's going on in the atmosphere. These changes are called the PDO, the Pacific Dectal Oscillation. It has a, um, a, a time of about a 60 year for a full cycle. So here is um, a cool climate uh, as uh, indicated by the, um, the cool ocean water. And here's a, here is a warm climate. The ocean has two modes. It's like an on-off switch. It's either warming or cooling. There's nothing in between. It flips from one mode uh, to another. Uh, I'm going to skip that. And so if we look at the past PDO, it was cool from 1945 to 1977 in the oceans. And sure enough, the atmospheric temperature follows that. Uh, before that, from 1950 to 1945, we had warm ocean water. So what we can do is to take the past history of warming, cooling, warming, cooling on a 60-year cycle and project it into the future, which is what I've done here. So uh, at, um, at, at this particular point, I predicted in 1998 that we'd be in for global cooling. And sure enough, um, we, we have. This is what I said in 2000. Um, global warming is over. We can look ahead to cooler climates. 
And the question is how much? We don't really know exactly, uh, time will tell, but there are various models to uh, suggest uh, some differences. How well has my prediction uh, been doing? This is just for the US, but there's a slight cooling train, not a lot. Um, winter temperatures uh, from 2000 to 2010 were about eight degrees cooler in the central US and a couple degrees uh, cooler on the, on the coast. So uh, I'm going to skip through this um, and suggest that you don't throw away your park as yet. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can I have a hand? My balance is terrible. Uh, before I start, I thought I'd give a shout out to my great collaborator, Dr. Ronan Connolly and Dr. Michael Connolly from Ireland. Hello, Ronan and uh, Michael. And then uh, I also wanted to have a little promotion of this infographics that we produce. I hope everybody email us and ask for a copy of this. We really do it uh, with our love of science. And this infographic involves also another Connolly's, which is Dr. Imelda Connolly. And I'm glad today that I don't have to talk much about CO2, but I want to focus in on very key issues of Arctic sea level, uh, Arctic sea ice history. This is really a, a work that is done uh, uh, of our own free will, so we're really truly independent scientists, independent of fundings and, and all of that. Okay. So we're going to put the uh, UN under this uh, boxing highlight. We really want to check whether what all these statements that has been said about the Arctic, the climate, and uh, of course the sea ice, which is a key factor, uh, signature of the uh, Arctic region, the polar region, whether what has been said by the US, uh, UN uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is, has any resemblance to the inconvenient truth of reality. So we'll start with that chapter from the... AR5, for those who are not familiar with AR5, it's the fifth assessment report. I hope they don't produce, keep producing this. In fact, the sixth assessment is coming up. So we are going to examine what they've been said in, in, in this particular report. So I will highlight for now two simple questions or statement or claim that has been made by this report. The first thing is about Arctic sea ice and Northern Hemisphere <coughs> spring snow cover have continued to decrease in extent. And they say this is very high statistical confidence. So let's look at it. First, spring snow ice disappearing from Northern Hemisphere according to IPCC AR5. So how, how good is that statement, right? Data shows 1965, since we have some satellite coverage, we can actually do a very good uh, documentation of Y area so we can measure these particular changes over time. Indeed, the spring Northern Hemisphere uh, uh, ice snow cover has been decreasing. <coughs> But I guess the key question that I highlight down there is uh, why did they mention only spring? I hope you all know the answer, right? It's very simple. It's just because, simply because the fall snowfall has been increasing and then the winter snowfall has been increasing. Too bad that I don't have time to explain why the spring uh, snowfall is increasing. It's probably related to the increasing spring insulation uh, 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 changes over a time period due to the orbital changes of the uh, planet perturbing the, the Earth's sun. Uh, Geometrical con configuration. The second point is, why do they mention only the Arctic? Isn't that convenient? Arctic sea has been decreasing. Yes, we know it's been decreasing. Where's the data? The data is here. On the top panel, you know where polar bear live? That's why we call Arctic. It's been decreasing. But unfortunately, we all know most of us are smart enough now because we are database people. We look into it. It doesn't make sense to only talk about the Arctic and then don't talk about the Antarctic, right? So it is that kind of stuff that makes people really don't want to trust UNIPCC. I, for one, would never trust. Ask my son, independent of me. He won't agree with this sort of statement, right? It's ridiculous. <laughs> but what happened? Remember, this is based on satellite observation, but the key context about science is always is that, okay, we have this measurement, but you know, what is the error bar and what have we seen before, that sort of stuff. But before satellite error, we really have very limited record. 
in this particular work that we're doing, we went through really enormous amount of work, looking into whaling logs, aerial reconnaissance, icebreaker record, you know, all this stuff, all this good stuff that at least give us a sense of reality because we truly believe in database sort of discussion before we go anywhere else. So this is the way that IPCC report would present the result. The satellite era, we, we of course highlight for you to see that this is the big difference between satellite era, because the problem is that we really know that the climate changes, as uh, Don has shown very well, changes on the multi-decadal sand. You have warming, you have cooling in every 50 or 60 years or so kind of oscillation. But look at the pre-satellite era from 1900 or so to let's say 1970s. Kind of flat, isn't it? Plus that we know very well that from 45 to about 76 or so, there is a period of cooling that is happening in the Arctic. But how come the sea ice data is so flat, right? But this is the official record. This is why we are very suspicious of this result. So we went through and checked whether it's true or not because science is about also verification, independent verification. Obviously, you know that we didn't come up with the same answer as them. So I'll show you later. But we know that from Arctic temperature, by the way, Information on sea ice is a lot harder to collect than at least the temperature, even though it is imperfect, but we have a good sense of Arctic temperature covering about 100, you know, 150 years or so over the Arctic. You can see that from 1900 to about 1940, you have a warming period. And then 1940 to the 70s or so is cooling and then Arctic warming again. Okay, but the key question is, yeah, indeed, even if you have the, the warming from the 70s, the Arctic sea has been decreasing. But we know that it follows a period of cooling. So where's the evidence for that? That sea ice increasing, actually. It's supposed to increase. So this is the three, three kind of major problem with pre-satellite data. The first one is actually the data sources for each region is changing over time. So for, for example, 20 and 30s, you have mostly the ship observation. From the 50 to 70, you have the really in situ, the buoy which is really also very key in, in giving us real information. And then you have region that cover the change over time, okay? Finally, you really, the serious problem is that most of the Arctic was not observed at all. Nobody has the real data to, to look at these things. So it's imperfect, but here's what we come up with. But we give one example now on this problem from IPCC report, okay? On your left there is basically so-called sea ice map that is produced by the Danish group. They are very, very good in keeping record, of course. But the problem is, when people are looking at this data, so we pick this example of August 1952, they actually just put the whole area white. It's as if that there is actually sea ice there. But look at the actual cautions that nobody read. Okay, the ice was supposed, but no information is at hand. So they are only guessing. And then, Ever since then, because those are the Russian sector, those are the Chukchi Sea and the East Siberian Sea, and you look at the actual data that the Russian just released the data, and we have gotten those data from those great people from St. Petersburg, and they're showing the data like that. You can see what a mismatch of information, okay? Over-exaggeration of, of the sea ice actually pre-satellite era, showing as if that now the change would be very dramatic. So this is a new work. The paper is already accepted as in the press, so please ask us for the paper in case you want to read in more detail, so no way I can cover this in 15 or 20 minutes. These are Ronan, this is uh, Michael. And this is the paper, don't read the abstract, just to show you that it is a work that uh, has been accepted for publication. But a very important point that I want to make, which bothers me a lot, is that this work, I'm not even supposed to do it as a scientist, okay? It's not an official work. So it's doing it under my own free time and my own volunteer. No expense uh, uh, was covered by anyone or anybody. And we just do it our own fund for, for learning about the science. Okay? That's, the only, that's a big point. To try to make the point that you, know, you don't really need big money to do good quality science. You don't need all these endless charades of asking for funding and all these circus about, about money, this, money, that. So for this real work, these are the steps. It's very simple, really. But the, the main point I want to point you is that for Arctic sea ice, look at the seasonality, how you define it. For summer, it's not, it's not June, July, August. It's actually July, August, and September sea ice. You have to account for the real climatology. What happened there? So you really have to be really careful. So what we did is that we divide the data into three regions. So we have the North American region, and then the, the Siberian, the Russian region, and then we have the European region, right? We actually use the information from temperature data. 
we calculate the temperature trend, we divide into three regions and four seasons, and then we get the sea ice data, the accurate sea ice data from the satellite era since 1978 or so. And then we work out the relationship between sea ice and temperature for every region. And then don't read into this. Essentially, we use the temperature, the calibration that we have for this period, and then we use the temperature to bring back from to 1900. And then the key step is step six. We use all that is available of the sea ice information to check the, the, the mean and the variance to try to really adjust it properly with respect to what is actually known from the temperature calibrated sea ice. And then, finally, we rescale everything. Okay? Please read in detail. This is a very careful work. This is the final result. So what we are able to show is that, yes, indeed, the satellite error, because we use the best data from satellite you have melting, but the period of growth from 43 to 70s is real. It's actually happening. And then you also have all this up and down, right? And then if you compare with the summer uh, extent of the IPCC approved result, you will see that the pre-satellite era is pretty flat. And plus that they never show the actually sea ice increasing in the 40s and the 70s, okay? And this is our summer reconstruction result. If you compare to that, I don't think it's too drastic what, what is being changed now compared to the past period. And let's look back a little, uh, uh, another question, which is, of course, the IPCC claim. Oh, if we don't do something about this atmospheric CO2. By the way, atmospheric CO2, here it is. <laughs> uh, Arctic sea ice is continued to shrink and thin in the northern hemisphere. You know that these are all purely based on computer model. And they've really been making this sort of prophecy about Arctic sea ice disappearing. Should we, should we keep saying this? They say it will soon disappear. You have seen report from 2016. It will disappear by 2016. 2014, 2012, 2013, 2008. And then finally, our good friend Tony Heller, one of these you know, free independent maverick, independent maverick who actually also have no funding for this kind of work. He actually found this uh, report from the fake news uh, headquarters, New York Times, uh, showing you that the claim of Arctic sea ice will be gone by 1988. It's really beyond belief, you know, that we could keep believing in this sort of stuff, you know, that it's not happening, and yet we still believe that these people have any credibility of making any claims. And here's the way the IPCC wants to show you. From, let's say, the observation period, they show you, oh, this is so many models, we're producing this, and then by 20, 2100, the scenario, by the way, is very ex extreme for the rise of atmospheric carbon dioxide because it believes that the pop human population by 2100 will be 12 billion people. And then the atmospheric carbon dioxide of the equivalence, if you add methane and all this stuff, will be almost 1,300 parts per million, which is quite a lot. So sea ice, bye-bye. But if you really want to believe in results, this result, I give you a little caution. Since we have our French uh, realist friends here, uh, this is actually a quote from Pierre Galois, which is the well-known uh, father of the atomic bomb of the French uh, uh, people. And he says that if you put garbage into a computer, nothing comes out of it but garbage. But this garbage, having passed through a very expensive machine, is somehow a noble and no one dare to criticize this. Actually, my son just taught me a trick. This is a lot, lot better to say this. IPCC want to tell you that this is a truck. <laughs> this is a truck. Okay? This is not a model. <laughs> Thank you, Franklin. If you think, look at the computer model. This is what they produce. It's decreasing. This is our reconstruction. They basically are very flat from those periods and then saying that, oh, CO2 come along, it's going to decrease. But I truly believe that this is really, really a natural kind of variability, even including what we observed by now, 2016. There's just no way you can make that claim. Yeah, it's the CO2 that did it, right? There's a murder in the room. <laughs> and then finally, if IPCC blames CO2, what is it? that could do it? Could it be the sun? That's the question. For this, for those full disclosure, again, I just wanted to study science, okay? So in terms of solar variability, you can see, I happen to choose to use that curve from the left. And then IPCC always promoted this particular curve and never ever discussed why the other curve could be wrong or right, okay? And it's always promoting this because they just want to believe in these particular people. And I show you now the results that we can produce with the Arctic sea ice, uh, uh, Arctic uh, surface temperature. This is the paper that has been published. The blue curve is the temperature, and then the red curve is actually the 
the, the solar irradiance changes over time. Okay, I think the fit is pretty good. And this paper has been peer reviewed and published. We published this, this a year ago. Uh, so I hope everybody, if you have more questions, please ask me or, or Ronan and, and Michael for reading. And, but are these Arctic sea ice changes uh, really new? Okay, that's, a, that's another question that I want to answer before I finish. I'm almost done. Please don't keep flushing me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's based on a paper from Germany, a Professor Rudiger Stein. I have already contacted them. This is actually a very, very good study that just came out about, you can see, three, three weeks ago. And what they are able to do is basically collected this uh, ocean sediment by around the Chukchi Sea and East Siberian Sea region. I'm going to show only the result from Chukchi Sea. This is a very clever technique. It's actually plankton, studying plankton, and you study a very special biomarker. It's from a fat, you know, lipid form. It's, uh, it's called ice proxy 25 carbons. Okay, it's a very, very clever technique. So they can measure it. It's kind of unique, so it's very good work that's been going on. So despite all the problem, I think we do have some interesting work. So they produced this new paper. Currently, around that area, you have basically seasonal sea ice. Seasonal sea ice just mean that you have sea ice in the, in the winter, and then summer, it, when it's warm, and it's extremely warm, it will be ice-free. But is this unusual? I hope you know the punchline. For Chukchi Sea, sorry for the graph, but uh, it shows you that you basically can have three categories of sea ice. One is basically the reduced, which is actually often ice-free. You can see large part of the Holocene, 10,000 years ago until five, 6,000 years ago, it's always eye-free, okay? And then you have the perennial extreme, which is which of the sea ice is filled all year round. So for this region, we have never seen it. For now, we basically mostly seasonal sea ice. So you can see that the, the sea ice actually hasn't been perennial for the last 10,000 years. And it's often re reduced during the Bronze Age and, and, and earlier, right? The Bronze Age is about 3,000 BC to about... Uh, 500 BC or so. So, and the sea ice coverage changes over century time scale, and this seems to have relationship with solar activity as, as, as shown by Professor Stein. So I'm done now. The question is, Arctic sea ice indeed has been decreased since 1970, but the key point is simultaneously Antarctic sea ice is increasing. We really need to, need to answer the question instead of just saying, oh, looking at just specific evidence that we found CO2. Obviously, it's not CO2 doing that. Then, you can see that it was increasing from 1940 to 70. Can IPCC try to explain that with rising CO2? Then, you can see that IPCC's conclusion, especially those future projections another you know, 85 years from now, is based on computer models. I mean, those things are I mean, as good as my modeling work, right? So it's not good. It's really not good work at all. And then finally, Arctic sea ice has been repeatedly advancing and retreating long ago, since before the Bronze Age. Was anybody driving SUV then? <laughs> so I also conclude that from all that I know, I look into this, I mean, it's really that like maybe related to the sun, although, you know, we don't come here to bang our chest that I'm so smart that I found the sun to be doing that. Science is continual journey of keep testing and retesting your ideas and your hypothesis and based on what the data is available. So I propose that IPCC should start taxing the sun if they don't like this idea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we, we have 10 or 12 minutes for questions, I believe. 10 minutes for questions. I ask that you raise your hand to be recognized. I will recognize you. Tim will bring over a microphone. Do not start speaking until Tim gets the microphone. Please identify yourself as well, please. Yes. First of all, I have to excuse myself for my poor English especially because I used to form complicated sentences. So in case you don't understand, please interrupt me. Number two, my name is Michael Limburg from Germany, Eike. Thank you for mentioning us, Fred. Um, so this is my identification. And um, then I would like to add two remarks to the three um, speeches. Number one, is the winter in Germany becomes cooler since the last 30 years. That's what we found out using the official uh, data of the Met Office in Germany. Number two, and that's the most important, my feeling is that the error propagation and the error identification is not well done in research. 
I know besides me just one person who did a lot of work there, this Pat Frank. And when you do this, um, the unavoidable systematic errors prevent you for getting precise data. That might be the answer why Fred found out that eight data sets don't fit with each other, and you can find out what you uh, will. Everybody can look what he will. You did a lot of uh, research there. But the only exception uh, for the uncertainty, which is rather big, Sir, which is not involved, you have I'm, a I'm comes through too, is the oscillations. You see oscillations in all these curves, and they are always the same. But see, one tenth of a degree measurements are not producible by other, other data sets because you forget the huge data margin which is accompanied with the data. Hmm. Good comment. I think it was a comment, not a question. But then, yeah, in general, is that I think people oversold their products. I mean, there are times in which in science you really have to say you don't know and then you cannot quantify even these things. I'm sorry. Sometimes error bars is just a misnomer also because it's not an error bar. A lot of this time you simply don't know. There is no, uh, you know, problem is actually the homogeneous sampling of these results. So it's just ridiculous. Things are going out of proportion to the point where IPCC is putting this strange stuff about likeliness, 95%. Those are all sociology to, I mean, you really should put all of these people in hell. If there's a place for this, there will be a very special place I'll create for them. Please go there. <laughs> it's just nonsense. I mean, cut it out, you know? I mean, every little kid will even know that this is wrong. Um. I ask that uh, we have to be quick. Comments, no <laughs> questions. Yes, please. Uh, ben, ben Denniston with 21st Century Science and Technology. Hello? OK. Ben Denniston with 21st Century Science and Technology. Uh, for Dr. Soon, a few years ago, there was a number of studies saying the sun was going to a longer term weakening period, potentially. A magnetic field around sunspots getting weaker, certain subsurface processes indicating that not just a regular 11-year minimum, but potentially going into some kind of new Maunder minimum or Dalton minimum level reduction in activity in the coming decades, half century or so. Do you have any opinions on that? Do you think that's something we're heading into? The, the detail, we should carry it outside. But uh, I'm a lifelong uh, researcher on the, on the physics of the sun. I have to tell you that... Uh, you know, I'm taking a, a bit of an agnostic view on it because, again, I need to stay consistent with this problem about information we don't have. You even mentioned the internal part of the sun. There's just really not much data point there. There are some interesting uh, hints, but then a lot of this stuff, I think, put it this way, we're not ready to, quote, unquote, offer a scientific prediction. That's my claim. But, of course, you can always do a lot of statistical extrapolation. They are useful for certain level of discussion. But if you want to call it science, I think it's very hard to justify it from my point of view because I think one still need to be cautious. As much as you criticize IPCC for, not, for predicting er, you know, the error of CO2 and then forcing the climate, and you have to be careful about what you can predict about the science or not. That's my opinion. Hi, uh, Susan O'Toole um, with the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. I'm probably the only federal worker here who follows this, these conferences, and thank you very much for these excellent presentations. Dr. Soon, I'd like to ask, you always, or all of you are quite, always quoting the IPPC. Have you ever had an opportunity or attempted to bring the IPPC together so you could have a dialogue or debate together in public about what they are claiming and what you are claiming? If the question is towards me, I think you didn't see my white hair. I really have a lot of white hair. I have tried a lot. You can check back. Second and third assessment IPCC cited my work very prominently. And then all of a sudden, because we're running out of favor in a sense, okay? Oh yes, we tried for years and years and years. But the strategy has becoming so bad now, I would just say we just have to close IPCC. Seriously, just close it, because they are really anti-science movement. There are too many of these people now growing too large, and year by year, every year, it's just conferences here and there. Nothing has been done, not serious about science, never want to talk about anything. I'm willing to help them, please. Tell IPCC to contact really soon. It's very easy to find me. <laughs> no problem. If they want to see me, come see me. Set appointment. Michael, thank you for your comment. 
And your question, I want to respond very briefly. What happened during the last decades of the 20th century was a drastic change in the method of observation, both for ocean and for land. On ocean, we introduced floating buoys for the first time, and they gradually took over. And on land, we cut the number of stations drastically and put them in places of airports. This change in the observing population is the basic reason why there has been an, uh, a reported warming, which does not exist. That is the main conclusion I've come to. I still don't know, and we need to work on what happened to the rise in CO2. It must produce some kind of an effect. Craig, can I add um, one more statement about his result? I have to say that if you guys study our paper in 2015, we reconstructed the northern hemisphere temperature using only the rural to try to get rid of so-called non-climatic effect. We clearly see what Fred is claiming, which means 1940s is warm, you know, 30s, 40s warm, and then it cools, and then it warms up again, but then the high at the 21st century is more or less the same. You know, it really shows that the, the bias of this last one is very clear, that it's a non-climatic type. Observationally, and we have to ask whether the pause in global warming will continue as it has existed now since 1940. There's been no warming observed, consistent warming, whether it will continue. If it continues, then we have to look for various mechanisms that can offset the effects of CO2. I look for negative feedbacks. I can distinguish three kinds of negative feedbacks, but uh, the discussion gets a little complicated and I will not pursue it now, except in private conversation. If anyone wants to discuss it, please come and see me and I will be happy to discourse on it. Thanks. This, this will be the last question. Um, Hi, um, Adam Woldavsky, representing myself. I have a question for Dr. Easterbrook or anybody who cares to answer. Uh, what would your scientific opponents say about your presentation today? They would probably have apoplexy would be my, <laughs> my first, first response. Um, and my response to all, all of the assertions of things that are made by the, the, the alarmists is uh, let's talk evidence. Uh, my whole career is essentially a purveyor of evidence and the facts speak for themselves. And so I would argue that the, the factual information that we now have, some of it's clear, some of it's cloudy, some of it is, is obscure. But there's some things we know uh, almost for sure. Uh, and some of those things I, I presented today, my guess is that their response would be uh, that, oh, uh, he's just one of those deniers and so you can't believe anything he says. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we have another session in uh, approximately five minutes. So if uh, you're going to be in this session, just stay along. If you've got another the next door session, uh, please uh, get ready to go over there. Thank you again.
<clears throat> Can our panelists come forward and uh, let's prepare to start the uh, session. So that, that's the only slide that, that's going to be out here. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you'll be able to see it too well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting issue. Okay. Should we start with 10? Start with uh, 15. Okay. okay, so this is going to come to the end. We can see the slide. And then you're out of luck. Okay, and the music starts. <laughs> Okay, can we take our seats, please? Yeah, where are you going to be sitting? I think he told you 15. If you go a little bit over, I don't think it's a big deal, but... you might want to do is just walk out in front if you want to. I mean, I would think if you have this on, you know, tough to say. I mean, you'd have to be able to. Okay, now this is fine. Can I just stand right here for a second? Yeah. Oh, no, this is fine. All right, can we please take our seats and we'll get started. All right, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming to our session today. If we could have our seats please and be quiet for just a second. Thank you and welcome to our session today dealing with the costs and benefits of climate change policy, especially as it relates to the social cost of carbon. My name is Craig Rucker. I serve as the executive director of the Washington DC based Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow or CFACT. And um, I will be the moderator of today's panel uh, which includes experts on this issue, such as uh, Kevin DeRatna of the Heritage Foundation, Dr. Robert Mendelson of Yale University, and Professor Ross McKittrick of the University of Guelph in Ontario. Uh, these gentlemen will be looking at and discussing the very controversial topic of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, they'll no doubt be addressing so-called social cost of carbon in particular, which has become a matter of great controversy in recent years. Uh, just to set this up, uh, many of you know that by law, many government agencies are often required to show that the benefits of a proposed regulation do not exceed the costs. Sometimes this is straightforward. If it costs an industry $100 million to prevent pollution that will only do $10 million of damage, uh, the government, in theory, should not be uh, going forward with that regulation and forcing businesses to comply with it. Uh, but what about climate change? Uh, how do you capture the benefits and costs of preventing something that eludes our scientific understanding? Um, and uh, how do you provide this or come to some sort of conclusion when the data is so controversial? Well, uh, 
there is a former administration that think they, thinks they solved this. The Obama administration has done something what they consider seemingly impossible. They've calculated the cost of all expected effects of carbon emissions. Uh, they foresaw into the future, channeled and divined, and they um, looked at all future hurricanes, droughts, mass extinctions, things of that sort, and they've come up with a very specific number. That number is $36 a ton. All right, so it's very scientific, and they've uh, determined that, of course, uh, that one ton of carbon emissions released in the atmosphere will prevent $36 million of damage into the, to the planet into the future. Uh, President Obama, or $36 worth of damage into the future, President Obama, in order to come up with this number, formed the Interagency Working Group back in uh, 2010 and again in 2013 to estimate the uh, social cost of carbon and relied on three principal models. One is the DICE model by William Nordhaus from Yale University. The other is the FUND model by Richard Toll at Sussex University and the PAGE model by Chris Hope in Cambridge University. Our, since they've come up with this, uh, of course, these models have come under attack and many are calling for a re-examination of their use, especially in the wake of the political changes that are now going on in Washington. I suspect our panelists will take issue with some of these calculations. Uh, first up is Robert Mendelson. He is a professor of economics and management at <coughs> and Edwin Weyerhaeuser Davis Professor of Forest Policy at Yale University. He has written more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and edited six books. The focus of his research has been on the valuation of the environment. His most recent work values the impact of greenhouse gases, included the purported impact of climate change on agriculture, forests, water resources, energy, and coastlines. Robert? It's a, it's a great honor to be here. I, I sort of feel like I'm a sheep being brought into the lion's den. You probably don't expect uh, someone from Yale University to be uh, very helpful on this topic of climate change. Uh, there you go. So uh, maybe I can surprise you, maybe not. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is, was trying to come up with the social cost of carbon. Let's see, this is not going to work. OK. Whoop. Come up with the social cost of carbon. So why would, do we want a social cost of carbon? What is it? That's what we're going to try to talk about first. And it turns out the social cost of carbon is trying to tell you what the price of carbon should be. So, one of the things that we believe in, that this group seems to believe in, is that we believe in markets. Markets are very powerful tools. And one of the things that, that makes markets work is that we have prices for things. And once we have prices for things, it turns out the people that produce know exactly how much to produce. So why do we want a social cost of carbon? We want to get the price of carbon right. And if we got the price of carbon right, then it turns out that everybody in the fossil fuel business will know exactly what they're supposed to do after that. They'll figure out exactly what the most efficient things to be doing in terms of abatement of costs, in terms of picking out which fossil fuels you want to burn, when you want to burn them. So it turns out we want this price. This price is really important for the marketplace so it can figure out what to do about this problem. If you don't pick a social cost of carbon, then you're going to pick regulations. You're going to end up with individual rules that say you must do this, you must do that. And one of the things that I think we all recognize is that when the government gets in, in this business, there's lots of things the government's about doing with that, and we're not going to like that from a market perspective, and it's not going to be very efficient. So we want to have a social cost of carbon because it is the price of carbon. And if you know the price of carbon, it turns out that if you're in the business of producing energy, you'll actually know where to go in the future and what to do. So what is it? It's trying to measure what's the actual damage of adding one more ton of carbon into the atmosphere. That's exactly what it's trying to do. So when it, you actually can calculate that, then it turns out um, you know how much you ought to spend to avoid it. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to figure out, you put a ton of carbon in the atmosphere, it turns out it's going to stick around there for a long time. That's one thing the science is pretty clear about. And as it sits around there, it's going to contribute to climate change. How much it contributes to climate change, that's a climate science question. But the, what I'm assuming is that the scientists have some idea what they're talking about and that, that it's going to result in a small change in climate. And what we're going to do is follow that change in climate over time. We're going to see all the things it's going to do into the future. And then we're going to take the present value of it back. So we're going to discount it back using the interest rate to try to figure out 
what is it worth today? So that's what we're trying to do with this social cost of carbon. What is it actually, where, where is this social cost of carbon? Was it measuring? It's measuring impacts across the world. So one of the things that's pretty clear, you warm up the, the, the uh, you put CO2 in the atmosphere, you don't just warm up the United States, you don't just warm up the place around the power plant. This is a global issue, you warm up the whole planet. So when you're measuring this, it turns out you're measuring impacts across the world. And that's important to understand because the bulk of the damages from climate change are not going to be felt in the rich world. The bulk of the damages are going to be happening closer to the equator, which means that it's the poor two-thirds of the world. They're the ones that are going to feel most of the damages. And when you calculate the social cost of carbon, you might say, well, how much of that is U.S. impacts? Well, it turns out the U.S. is not particularly vulnerable to warming in the near term. The kind of warming we're going to see in the near term is going to affect the southern tier of the United States, but not most of the country. Most of the country might actually benefit from this. So the share of the U.S. in global damage is quite small. And that's important to understand. When people are saying this is the price of carbon, they're not saying this is the damage to the United States. What they're saying is this is the damage to the world. Now, if everybody in the world contributes to the cost of this, the, the U.S. will only be paying its fair share. But it's, this is not U.S. damages. This is global damages. So what are these damages? What happens? So if but the planet warms, it turns out a small part of the world economy is vulnerable. And most of the world economy that's vulnerable is the part that deals with the outside, that involves interactions with the environment. So the agriculture is one of the things we're worried about. We, we know that sea level rise is occurring. The idea is that warming in the planet is going to increase that a little bit more. That, that's going to result in coastal inundation. That's going to be an issue. If it gets warmer, it turns out that they're going to be increasing costs to try to keep the planet cool, to keep indoors cool. On the other hand, you won't have to spend as much money keeping yourself warm. Um, we know that there's going to be some issues with water. Water is probably going to become more scarce, more valuable, and so that that's going to cause a damage. And then finally, there's going to be a change to ecosystems that will directly affect how, tr how fast trees will grow. Our current best estimate is that trees will grow faster in this warmer world, so that's actually likely to be a benefit, not actually a damage. And then there's going to be, that's things to the economy. So a little, it's 5% of the economy that is potentially vulnerable to, to this, but potentially important parts of the economy. And then there's, there's non-market things we're worried about. There could be some effects on health. Diseases can actually spread into places where they don't exist right now. That could cause trouble. We'll have more opportunities to have heat stress. And then there's going to be some changes in ozone. Ozone will form more rapidly. So there's going to be some health effects that are associated with this. And finally, the most dramatic thing that's going to happen if we warm the planet is ecosystems are going to change. Now, that's a scientific fact that they're going to change. What kind of damages we associate with that, that's not so clear. Uh, that, that part has not been established very, very um, carefully. So these are the things we're worried about. They're going to cause the, the, the effects we're, we're going to generate. And it's going to happen over time. So if you look at one particular model and it throws in a ton of carbon dioxide today, it turns out it takes 20 or 30 years before that carbon dioxide, that ton, actually does very much. And that's because there's huge lags in this system. It turns out you don't warm the planet by warming the atmosphere. You warm the planet by warming the oceans. And the oceans are vast. So it takes a long time to warm the oceans. And so everything you do in terms of this greenhouse gas problem, it turns out they all have long lags. There's a big gap between taking an action and the consequence with this particular problem. It's not like sulfur dioxide. You put it up in the atmosphere, you get affected right away. You see exactly what you're up against. You stop putting SO2 up in the atmosphere, it goes away, it's gone. This is a problem, you put it in the atmosphere, it takes forever for anything to happen, and, and then it's going to happen, it's going to last forever. It's going to last for centuries. So that's important to understand that this, the consequences of this is a stream that happens way out into the future. Why do we want a price on carbon? If we can get a price on carbon that's uniform across the entire planet, we can at attack this problem cost effectively. That is, you set the price, it's the same price everywhere in the planet, every single polluter in the planet 
should equate their marginal cost curve to this price, you make a perfectly efficient system. That's the ideal system. If you don't do this tax, this price on carbon, your next best thing is you get individual regulators in each state, in each country, uh, in each place, setting different rules for different people. They're not going to equate marginal cost. It's going to be really expensive. Whatever they do, they're going to often be at cross purposes. Uh, they're going to spend a lot of money on stuff that has no effect, which is what we're doing today. And you're going to get, um, you're going to be spending a vast amount of money and getting nothing for it. So one of the things that's very obvious, if you're going to do anything about this, you want to be very careful that you do it wisely. And setting a common price is going to give you that. So the idea is you want to have this common price. What, what that price should be, we're going to talk about. But we want this common price. It's a very important to get this as an effective tool to do what we're trying to do in this case. So how is, how is this price going to affect the fossil fuel industry? Well, the fossil fuel industry is, where, is the source of a great deal of the greenhouse gases that we're worried about. So it is going to affect the fossil fuel industry. That's exactly why you have these rules. But the question is how? If the social cost of carbon is less than $100, you're still going to have a fossil fuel industry. That is not a high enough price to eliminate it. What you're going to try to do is try to move from high carbon to lower carbon fuels. That's what, that's what this tax is going to try to get you to do. And that's effectively what's going to happen to the industry. But if prices get higher than that, if you start approaching over $100, it turns out that you will then start to buy abatement devices, which will actually capture carbon as it leaves a fossil fuel plant. And then you'll try to be capturing that carbon and storing it underneath. So at higher prices, it turns out you still want to have a fossil fuel industry, but it turns out you'll have abatement technology at that point that's actually going to control the amount of emissions. And it turns out if you get a very high price, as you start getting up into two or $300, that's when you're going to actually leave your fossil fuels in the ground. So it's not that the social cost of carbon is the death knell of fossil fuels. It very much depends on the prices you're actually setting it at. So what are you going to do with these prices? It turns out the optimal set of prices start low and gradually get tighter as this problem gets worse. So if, as the planet gets warmer and warmer, the marginal damage of another ton is going to get more and more severe. And you're going to want to have those prices rise in concert with the amount of damage that's being done. Now, having said that, there's this perfect carbon price. The devil's in the details. When I was a college kid, the, uh, I remember that, that we had the Corps of Engineers who were going around building all these gigantic dams, and, and it turns out a lot of those dams should never have been built. Huge costs, low benefits. Wow, Congress finally said, we're going to do cost-benefit analysis. That's going to get rid of all these dams. OK, so in some sense, you set the carbon price right. It's going to manage this problem correctly, as, as efficiently as you can. You're done. But will we get the carbon price right? So my personal feeling is that this particular effort by the Obama administration did not get the carbon price right. Uh, in fact, one of the things that's interesting about this particular interagency task force is they couldn't make up their mind what the carbon price was supposed to be. Originally, it was $21, but they said, ah, that's not high enough. They came back later and said, oh, suddenly it's $24. Oh, that wasn't high enough. They came back, and now it's $36. What happened between the $21 and the $36? Did we suddenly discover that climate change was different than we thought it was? There was no new information. This was a political decision to try to get a carbon price that was basically part of the war on coal. So my personal opinion is this particular attempt to get at the social cost of carbon uh, failed. And it failed because um, the, the people that were in charge of it tried to get a very high carbon price that is not justified by the science. So they tried to get this $36. One of the things, the assumptions they made to get that number is they assumed there would never be any mitigation. That is, they're setting a price to great, create mitigation based on the idea there wouldn't be any mitigation. And what, what happens if that's true? It means nobody on the planet was going to mitigate, not just this year, not next year, not ever. And if you do that, it turns out 
you end up with no abatement. You end up with vast amounts of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. You end up with huge future damages. And they set that on the assumption that there was no abatement. But you don't want to set rules like, you don't want to set prices on the basis that you don't have the good. You don't want to set the price of water on the idea that you don't get water. Because if you set the price of water and since I'm only going to give you one liter, what would you pay for it? Well, you need two liters a day to survive. You're going to pay a lot for that first liter. That liter is, that's death or life for you. But you don't, that's not going to be the price of water. The actual price of water is like a penny for 10 gallons. So you, you wouldn't want to set it at a price as if water was incredibly scarce. You want to set it where the price is going to lead to a certain supply, and you want to know what the demand is at that supply. And so if you set the price so that you're actually going to get the mitigation that that price would cause, it turns out you would set a much lower price than what the, what the government recommended. So this is one of the places where they made a huge mistake. What else did they make a huge mistake about? They said, well, you know, the world is uncertain. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. So let's assume some of the worst things that could happen. Let's look at what those outcomes might be. And by looking at those outcomes and, and assuming there was never going to be any mitigation, well, it turns out the worst possible thing that can happen is pretty bad. All we have to do is use our imaginations and we can think of some pretty awful things. That was part of the other reason why the price is really, really high. And then the third thing that was wrong is it turns out they weren't thinking that we are going to adapt. They're assuming that climate was going to change, not over 10 years, not over 50 years, but over 100 or 200 years, and we would do nothing to adapt. And that turns out to be a huge mistake, because we are going to change if we find ourselves in a warmer world. It's pretty obvious. You take somebody from Maine and you put them down in Florida, if they behave like they're still in Maine, they're going to be in trouble. It isn't going to work. So one of the things that has to happen is you have to recognize we will all adapt. And we're going to adapt not because we want to save the planet, because we want to save ourselves. It's in our own interest to adapt as individuals, as firms, as communities, as local governments. We all have a reason to adapt. And as we adapt, the damages that will actually occur are going to be much less than what would happen if we did not adapt. And in this particular case, I'm guessing the difference between no adaptation, which is what the, most of the models assumed, and adapting is vast. And if you actually look at the damage that's caused if we adapt, it's much smaller than what the, this particular panel thought it would be. And so it turns out that the problem of climate change is not as catastrophic as many of my colleagues believe it to be. It turns out that we can, in fact, adapt to a warmer world. We can live in a warmer world. What we need to think about is just how far we want to go. How much warmer a world do we want to tolerate? And it turns out that, in practice, if we set prices like $5 a ton today, which is not going to affect our economic growth at all, if we set the prices at that price, we can keep the planet from warming dramatically, and we can stay away from the most ridiculous amounts of, of warming that are possible, and we can keep the planet safe. So my personal plea is that actually we have a place to go with climate change. It's a moderate place where we do moderate things today to get rid of carbon dioxide cheaply, and that we avoid the worst possible things that can happen, and that that is the world that we have at our fingertips. If I had to give advice to President Trump, it would be seize this moment, adopt some moderate policies, get the world on the right path, seize this, this issue, and take it away from the climate extremists. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I um, think one of the neat things about gatherings like this is that you can have people with different opinions, unlike the, uh, our opponents who operate on consensus and never deviate in their opinions on different things. Uh, we can have individuals like uh, Robert here who maybe accept the modeling or accept the concept of modeling, uh, but maybe uh, don't agree with the price or the methodology used. You have others like, I know CFAC policy analyst Paul Dreesen 
who thinks the benefits outweigh the cost and maybe we ought to be giving subsidies or major tax cuts to coal companies to keep pumping more out there for, because of the benefits of plant food. So we have those differences of opinion, uh, but nevertheless we discuss them here and I think that that's a constructive thing. Our next speaker is uh, Kevin Dyeratna. He is a senior statistician and research programmer at the Heritage Foundation's Center for Data Analysis. He has published extensive research on integrated assessment modeling regarding the social cost of carbon, methane, and nitrous oxide. In addition to energy modeling, Kevin has also worked on statistical modeling regarding important climate tax, labor, healthcare, welfare, and entitlement policy questions. He did his undergraduate work at the University of California, Berkeley, a bastion of conservative thought, <laughs> and uh, later went on to obtain two master's degrees at, and a doctorate degree in mathematical statistics at the University of Maryland. Kevin? Is this on? Okay. 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 Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Dyeratna, and I'm going to talk about the smoke and air mirrors behind integrated assessment modeling. So regarding integrated assessment modeling, which is basically the class of models that the social cost of carbon comes from, there are a bunch of fundamentally important questions to ask. Firstly, how does the government actually come up with the, its energy and climate policies? And secondly, are the tools for doing so even legitimate? So firstly, let me put forth this question, and Dr. Mendelson talked about this. What is the social cost of carbon? Well, in a nutshell, the social cost of carbon is defined by the EPA as the economic damages associated with a metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions. And the general question is, regarding the SCC, what is the long-term economic impact of carbon dioxide emissions summed across a particular time horizon? And there are three main statistical models that are used to get at this question. The DICE model, the FUN model, and the PAGE model. Now, these models are, a are basically a series of equations representing economic growth and climate response, and they're estimated via what we call Monte Carlo analysis. The idea is, is that various components of these models are random, so the random components are repeatedly drawn, these stochastic components, through Monte Carlo simulation, and in the long run, we generate a distribution of the SEC from which distributional properties are reported. So, before we go into the details of the SEC, let's just talk about the concept in the first place. They're determined by so-called damage functions, and these are plots from the IWG's Interagency Working Group's 2010 technical support document. And notice, there are a bunch of curves here. There's a red and blue curve, which are the dice and the page models, and there's a green curve right there. And if we zoom in, that's the next slide. If we zoom in, and the y-axis, by the way, is damages per unit of GDP, global GDP, and the x-axis is temperature, you notice that the green curve is actually negative. That's because out of the three models, the fun model is the only model that actually allows for benefits of carbon dioxide emissions. The other two models, a priori, only assume that they're costs. So let's keep this in mind as the talk goes on. Now, as with any statistical model, these models are grounded by assumptions. A discount rate, a time horizon, and the specification of what we call an equilibrium climate sensitivity distribution. So we ran two of the three models, the DICE and the FUN models. The PAGE model we didn't run because the author insisted on co-authorship for anything we publish. So we felt that that precluded us from being able to do any independent analysis. So regarding these assumptions, firstly, there's a discount rate. So we talked about economic damages, but the real question is, supposing there actually are damages, what amount should be invested to avert these damages, these so-called damages, from actually occurring in the future? So discount rates are a way to actually do so. And the EPA used 2.5%, 3 and 5% discount rates, despite the fact that the Office of Management and Budget in Circular A4 specifically stipulated that a 7% discount rate be used as well at a, as part of cost-benefit analysis. So despite the fact that this uh, requirement, the stipulation of a 7% discount rate be used, the IWG ignored it, but we ran it, these models at 7% for them. Now, secondly, there's a specification of a time horizon. So, as I talked about, projected economic damages are summed. But the real question is, for how long? Now, 
these models attempt to make projections 300 years into the future. Now, if you think about Dr. John Christie's testimony in front of co Congress, the House Science and Tech Committee last year, he juxtaposed temperature extrapolations from IPCC models against actual satellite and weather balloon data. And you could see the stark difference. You look at Dr. Christie's uh, projections based on the IPCC models and the actual data, and these models grossly overpredict temperatures. So when you think about it, these models are trying to make forecasts 300 years into the future. Firstly, we don't know what the economy will look like that far in the future, but when you think about things from a climate perspective, how on earth can they forecast 300 years into the future when they can't even predict 20? Lastly, these models involve the specification of an equilibrium climate sensitivity, or ECS, distribution. Now, global warming alarmists will always tell you, ooh, the science is settled on global warming. But I was talking about this a few weeks ago, and when you really think about it, the phrase settled science, that's an oxymoron. Science is something that's by definition unsettled. New studies consistently come to light, bringing, improving upon prior studies. And the concept of ECS distributions are no different. They consistently appear in the peer-reviewed literature. And here are four of them. The first distribution, Roe Baker 2007, was published 10 years ago in the journal Science. That's a whole decade ago, and that is the distribution that the IWG wanted to assume. Subsequent distributions, there are a few right here, which, are, which we use in our research. By the way, our research is uh, in the back table over there, and you guys are welcome to pick up copies of each of our papers. Um, <clears throat> these newer distributions are distributions that actually suggest lower probabilities of high-end global warming. So don't really want to go too much into the statistics here, but in a nutshell, an ECS distribution represents the Earth's temperature response to a doubling of carbon dioxide emissions. So the question is, okay, suppose carbon dioxide emissions were to double. How much would the Earth warm? Well, the areas under these probability density functions give you the probability that the Earth will warm by a particular amount. So for example, if we look at the yellow curve, which is the outdated Roe Baker distribution, and the area under the curve of four degrees or four and a half degrees Celsius onwards, that will tell you the probability that the Earth's temperature will, will warm by more than four or four and a half degrees in response to a doubling of CO2 emissions. But if you notice this tail probability and you compare it to the other more recent distributions, it's significantly lower. And when you compare it to the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, which we'll spend most of our time talking about today, we actually did our analysis on all the other distributions as well, which is in our research. But if you compare, say, the probability of the Earth's temperature warming by more than, say, four degrees, under the outdated Roe Baker distribution, the probability is slightly under 30%. But under the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, it is significantly lower, about 5 in 100. So what happens if we alter the assumptions that the IWG makes? In particular, we'll talk about what happens if you tweak the discount rate, or the ECS distribution. And this work is joint with my colleague here, Ross McKittrick, as well as David Kreutzer, who is now at the EPA. What if we were to tweak the discount rate and run the 7% discount rate that the IWG ignored? Just using the outdated Roe Baker distribution, we did so in our analysis. And here are the, the results for the DICE model. So in 2020, we noticed a $37.79 estimate of the social cost of carbon under a 3% discount rate. And under a 7% discount rate, we noticed a $5.87 estimate. Now, we also did this analysis using 2.5 and 5%. For brevity, I'm just including 3 and 7. Now, what happens if we use the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution that suggests a lower probability of high-end global warming? Well, if you look at that, even under a 3% discount rate, we notice a $19.66 estimate of the SEC. Under a 7% discount rate, we notice a $3.57 estimate. And if you compare just holding the ECS distribution fixed, how the SEC changes when you use 7% instead of 3%, we notice substantial drops in the SEC by 35 to 45% or so. Even more, actually, depending on the ECS distribution used. Now, the DICE model, so, so suppose, what if we were to change the ECS distribution and keep the discount rate fixed? How much would the results change? Well, here what you notice is that the results change by you know, about 40 to 50% in the years 2020 and 2050. So now how about the fun model? 
Again, this is the model that actually allows for benefits of carbon dioxide emissions. Well, under a 3% discount rate using the outdated Roe Baker distribution, we notice a $19.33 estimate of the SEC and a negative 37 cent estimate under a 7% discount rate. And this negativity is, again, very interesting, and I'm going to get back to this in a bit. But using the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, under a 3% discount rate, we notice a $3.33 estimate of the SEC. And under a 7% discount rate, we notice a negative $1.10 estimate. And now, if you look at the percent changes from just keeping the ECS distribution fixed under <coughs> the, between a 3 and 7% discount rate, we notice substantial drops in the SEC for each year. And now we notice if we keep the discount rate fixed and we switch the ECS distributions, under a 3 and 7% discount rate, the SEC drops substantially. In the year 2020, under a 7% discount rate, it drops by nearly 200%. So now speaking of the negativity, let's ask a general question. Is global warming necessarily a bad thing? That is, are there actually damages associated with carbon dioxide emissions? Well, according to the fund model, the answer is no. And in our analysis, we, uh, we computed the probability of a negative SCC, which would suggest that there are actually benefits of carbon dioxide emissions. And we notice here that under the outdated Roe Baker distribution, under a 3% discount rate, there is a slightly above a 10% chance of the SCC being negative, and it goes up to 60% under a 7% chance. And now, using the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution, these probabilities increase substantially. It's nearly 70% under a 7% discount rate using uh, the more up-to-date Lewis and Curry distribution for the year 2020. So now, does the madness stop with the SEC? Well, we also did this analysis for the social cost of methane and social cost of nitrous oxide that the federal government also uses. And we also noticed that they are very sensitive to very re reasonable changes in assumptions. Uh, in a similar manner to this, the, those uh, results drop by as much as 80% or more using more up-to-date assumptions. So what if we actually wanted to take these models seriously? Supposing they have legitimacy, which with these results all over the map, you really start to wonder about that. Well, <clears throat> I ran the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas-induced climate change, looking at a hypothetical simulation of eliminating all methane emissions from the United States completely as well as nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide emissions, just thinking about if we eliminated methane emissions from the United States completely, what would be the impact on global temperatures? So using, looking at these two graphs, the red line is current policy, and the green curve is a hypothetical situation of eliminating all methane emissions from the United States completely. And you'll notice that the curves are virtually identical Except in 2100, we notice a measly 0 0.02 degrees Celsius reduction in global temperatures. What about sea level rise? Well, we also notice in terms of sea level rise, a minuscule reduction. If you were to eliminate methane emissions from the United States completely, there would be around a 0.27 centimeter reduction in sea level rise. And speaking of sea level rise, what assumptions are being made about it in these IAMs? Well, that's a very interesting thing. Um, my friends Pat Michaels and Chip Knappenberger wrote a blog about this two years ago where I extracted sea level rise from the DICE model. And if you look at the sea level rise assumptions that are being made in the DICE model in the year 2300, they exceed the assumptions made by the IPCC, AR5's projected range of sea level rise, which is quite disturbing. Now, what would be the economic impact of taking these models seriously, assuming we were to implement a carbon tax that was commensurate with the SEC, as reported by the IWG. Well, we used the, Department of the Heritage Energy Model, which is a clone of the Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System, to get at this question. And we noticed by 2035, there'd be an average employment shortfall of over 400,000 lost jobs, a total loss of income of over $20,000 for a family of four, a 13 to 20 percent increase in electricity prices, and an aggregate $2.5 trillion loss in GDP. All this for a negligible change in global temperatures of less than 0.2 degrees Celsius change in temperature mitigation. So now somebody asked me a very good question. What impact would these policies have toward shifting toward renewables? Because that's really what many of the advocates of these types of carbon capture, carbon tax policies want. Well, with the heritage energy model, we also looked at this question in terms of energy consumption under current policy. 
the, here's a pie chart uh, depicting the different types of energies. And <clears throat> the blue component, the, the blue, uh, excuse me, the dark blue, red, and green components are uh, you know, petroleum, coal, and natural gas. The uh, purple component is nuclear. The blue component is renewables, which is a 9% uh, component of the energy portfolio. But now what would happen under the carbon tax scenario would we notice a notable uptick? Well, slightly, but only up to 14% or so. So if they're looking to you know, induce a shift toward renewables, that's not going to happen. So now let's think about what this tells us. These integrated models are extremely sensitive to very, very reasonable changes in assumptions. The damage functions at their core are arbitrary in the first place. They don't really have much legitimacy. And out of the three models, two of them all, all, a priori assume that they're costs. The other model can be negative under very reasonable assumptions suggesting that there are more benefits than costs of carbon dioxide emissions. And as a result, with these models being literally all over the maps, you can manipulate them to produce any result you want. If you want a high SCC, all you have to do is use the outdated assumptions that the IWG use, ignore the 7% discount rate, and you get a high SCC. If you want a negative SCC, just use the fund model and update your ECS distributions, and it's going to be more po negative than positive. And moreover, taking these models seriously in terms of the IWG's interpretation of them would result literally in economic disaster with few environmental benefits. So thank you. Happy to take questions at the end. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, appreciate you putting this into the world of reality. I mean, the social cost of carbon may come across as some sort of technical conversation, but has real world impacts in policy because a lot of the things that are done um, are being justified. Certainly renewable energy standards, the clean power plan and others are justified on the basis of this. And uh, one suspects as we see brownouts in, uh, in uh, Germany and Holland and Australia and the failures of renewable energy, uh, of course, there's probably a little bit of um, desire on the part of those advocating uh, for a higher so social cost of carbon to say that the impacts of climate change are worse, just to deliberately drive up the cost and make it more competitive. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Ross McKintrick. Um, he's a Canadian, uh, so you'll give, what, half your, <laughs> half your talk you had in to French, let them right? <laughs> That's right. So half in French, half in English. No. Uh, he is a professor of economics at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Canada is also what, what I just heard Lord Moncton just told me something about it, that they have, being next to the United States, they could have had American efficiency in having the French influence, French culture, but they chose the opposite, right? <laughs> <laughs> French efficiency, American culture. Anyway. Ross specializes in environmental economics and has published dozens of peer-reviewed journal articles on a wide range of topics, including the economic theory of pollution policy and climate policy options, among others. Ross is the author of an award-winning book entitled Taken by Storm, The Troubled Science, Policy, and Politics of Global Warming. He's given many academic presentations throughout Canada, the United States, and Europe, including one before the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So it is our pleasure to have you here, Ross. Take Thanks. it away. <clears throat> All righty. Um, so I'm going to continue the discussion about social cost of carbon. And um, one thing I notice is that uh, right now everybody's an expert on carbon taxes and the social cost of carbon. This is uh, uh, James Baker, part of a group of uh, elder statesmen who uh, made a presentation uh, issued a report um, confidently pronouncing on some policy options. Um, the trouble is, maybe next time they'll uh, issue a report on, on quantum theory or something <laughs> like that. It's, these are, this is a very technical topic, and there are a lot of people that weigh in on it. Even some of my colleagues in economics jump in on, on carbon taxes, and it's obviously haven't spent the time to read up on it. So there are a lot of wrong ideas that are floating out there. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, clean up a few of them today. Um, to summarize what I'm going to say, the main thing is the social cost of carbon on its own is never the right number to use in policy decisions. So if someone says the social cost of carbon is $30, therefore we should do X, Y, and Z, there are some important steps that they're missing along the way. 
Um, now, bear in mind that all that number does, all the social cost of carbon, it's meant just to tally up the numbers on one side of the ledger. We are ignoring all the benefits of fossil fuel use. That also has to be brought into the whole discussion, obviously. So it's only half of a benefit cost analysis. So it isn't a legitimate criticism of the social cost of carbon to say that fossil fuel use is beneficial. It would be legitimate if that was ignored in the policy discussion, but the social cost of carbon concept itself is only part of the picture. Um, and um, as Kevin pointed out, some of the models ignore the potential benefits of CO2 fertilization and warming trends, countries like Canada that would actually benefit from longer growing seasons. Some of the models just assume that all out and uh, that's not a legitimate uh, modeling strategy. Um, and a positive social cost of carbon certainly doesn't imply that fossil fuel use should be eliminated. So uh, on that point, suppose magically we come up with a number, $31.24 per ton. That's the social cost of carbon. All that tells us is that the use of fossil fuels by uh, someone to run their car or something imposes an external cost on the rest of the world. If we charge people that cost or something like that cost, chances are they're just going to continue using the fuels as they were before because the um, use of the fuels is very valuable. The more important thing is that if there's a regulation that costs more than 31.24 per ton, we shouldn't implement that regulation. It's kind of a cutoff level that says everything that costs more than this is more costly to society than the benefit that it would do. And this gets forgotten in a lot of the popular discussion. So um, when we talk about carbon taxes, for instance, um, economists like to think of it as an either or proposition. Carbon taxes would replace all the regulations, not be added on top of them. And as I'll show you, that's important because a lot of the regulations in place cost way more than even the IWG's estimate of the social cost of carbon. So, uh, what I'll get to next is that we wouldn't actually want to charge a carbon tax of 31.24 per ton. It needs to be modified from there. Um, that, would, that strategy only applies in a very simple textbook world where there are none of the real world complications in our economy. So um, let me draw a picture at this point. Uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, there's emissions, and on the vertical axis, there's money, dollars per ton or dollars per unit of emissions. And there's a downward sloping line that uh, in economics we call the marginal abatement cost curve. It's like a demand curve. Uh, if you had to pay $10 a ton for your emissions, how much would you emit? Well, it's just like if you had to pay $10 for shirts, how many shirts would you buy? It's just a demand curve. So at the beginning of the process, there's no price being charged on emissions, so everybody just goes to the um, part that corresponds to a price of zero, where the curve meets the horizontal axis, and that's called the unregulated emissions level. And then when we think about something like a, a carbon tax or an emissions tax, the idea is, okay, now we're going to raise the price of the emitting activity on the expectation that in response to that higher price, people will reduce their emissions. So we would go to that point on the graph there. And if we're happy with the price that's being charged, then that means we have to be happy with the emission level that, that results from it. So this is the basic textbook model. And then uh, now, the combination of the price and the quantity means all of a sudden there's revenue that has to be disposed of somehow, and, and that gets people kind of excited because it sounds like free money all of a sudden. The policy is generating lots of money and we can spend it, but how that money is used is extremely important for determining the cost of the policy for reasons that I, I won't get into today uh, in detail. Um, but let's suppose we knew the social cost of carbon and we set that as the price. So this is the simple textbook model a lot of economists have in mind. If we know that number, T star, then that means we would go to emissions level E star and we're done. We're happy that's, that's the right outcome. I would caution that a lot of people who advocate for carbon taxes don't actually like the implied emissions level that goes with it. They have in mind a, a reasonable low carbon tax, but they want emissions to go way down even further. So if you sort of keep reading in their reports that, well, the tax on its own won't be enough. We'll have to add in lots of regulations and then they're, they're violating their own logic. But we, we get this in Canada a lot. I don't know if it happens down here. <laughs> now, there's a complication, which is that first line I drew is the private marginal abatement cost. That means it's the, the abatement cost for individuals and emitters. 
There's another category of cost, though, associated with how this new policy interacts with the rest of the tax system, these tax interaction costs. And so there's a social marginal abatement cost curve. And there was a lot of writing on this back in the uh, 80s and 90s, and, and the effect is it looks like a rotation of the curve up like that. So the optimum is actually no longer at E star where I drew. Um, it's out there. So what we want is a policy to get us to that other, the higher emissions level. And in order to do that, we would need a lower tax. Um, so this, that second tax rate is lower because um, people respond according to their private marginal abatement cost, but we want an outcome on the social marginal abatement cost curve. So uh, how do we, what's the formula for reducing that tax rate? Well, it turns out to a fairly simple formula. You would take the social cost of carbon and divide it by a number called the marginal cost of public funds. Now, MCPF is an old term from public finance. If you're in government, you want to raise a dollar for the government revenue. It doesn't cost a dollar to the economy. It, um, in order to raise that revenue, you would have to destroy more than a dollar's worth of private economic wealth and, and welfare. Like, you might have to destroy a dollar fifty worth of private economic activity to raise another dollar of revenue for the government. So the marginal cost of public funds is, is more than a dollar. And it can be quite high. Um, and a, an important point here, uh, sort of a, an extra nuance to this, is even if everybody's going to pay the same social cost of carbon, it doesn't mean that every country should have the same tax rate, because every country has different marginal cost of public funds. In Ontario, for instance, a recent estimate is our marginal cost of public funds is now over $6. We have very high taxes in Ontario, and the tax mix is particularly distortionary. Uh, Alberta's down around $1.70, it's on the lower end, but Ontario it's over $6. So if the social cost of carbon is $42, then that would mean the tax rate should only be $7 in Ontario, much higher in Alberta. Um, so that's one adjustment that we make just to take account of the distortions of the tax system. But I'm still assuming a whole bunch of stuff here. One is that um, we don't have any command and control policies remaining in the background, and, um, or we're not using tradable quotas or cap and trade in the background. Um, also, um, I'm assuming the rest of the tax system is optimal, it's, it's fully efficient, <laughs> which is never the case. And also, I'm assuming that the money that's used, that's raised through a carbon tax, is used to reduce other tax rates. If you follow James Baker and his group's advice and just send out checks to everybody and pay them as dividends, that actually makes the whole thing much more distortionary. So what happens if we add these assumptions in? Well, the picture changes again. So the curve, the social marginal abatement cost curve, it isn't a rotation, it shifts out like so. And so now uh, we're, we're not at the right outcome again, with our, even with our lower tax rate. Um, so I'm going to clean up the diagram here. And now if you look at that unregulated emissions level, the odd thing is that the social marginal abatement cost curve now, you have to jump to get up to it. The first unit is, isn't free anymore. So there's a threshold that you have to cross for the first unit of emissions reduction. And now we want to get to the crossing point between the social cost of carbon and the social marginal abatement cost curve, which is out there. So now we can see in this, the way I've drawn the diagram here, we're at a pretty low tax rate once we take into account that threshold jump. In this case, you get to a point that's so low that a carbon tax is very close to doing nothing at all. That the, the optimal emissions level is now pretty close to the unregulated emissions level. This is the outcome if you have a suboptimal tax system, if the carbon tax is not your sole regulatory instrument, and if the policy is not revenue raising or revenue neutral. In other words, if you're doing this in the real world, uh, if you're outside the textbook world. Okay, now how big is that threshold value? I can only find one reasonably thorough estimate of it in the literatures back in 1996. Um, it came out at about $50 a ton for the US economy. So it's actually a pretty big number. In today's dollars, that'll be about $75 a ton. So if you ignore every, all the complaints, or I shouldn't call them complaints, all the criticisms of the IWG work that you've heard so far, and we'll just take their number of about $40 a ton at face value, it's still below this threshold. So the first unit of, of emission reduction uh, in this approach is still welfare reducing, even if carbon is a positive externality. That's the picture that we have. The social cost of carbon, just on the mainstream of what we've seen so far, is apparently below the damage threshold and 
policies can't be reduced. Now, what uh, Kevin showed you was this contrast between that green curve, the Roe Baker equilibrium climate sensitivity distribution, and the empirical literature. And in our work, we drew on the second one from the right there, the Lewis and Curry distribution. Obviously, the empirical literature is not drawing from the uh, modeling literature, the modeling distribution for climate sensitivity. When you put that into the model, then of course the social cost of carbon drops even further. But even if we did ignored that, uh, my colleagues and I have done work in recent years pricing out some of the existing policies in Canada on a per ton basis. And you can see like the vehicle efficiency standards over $300 a ton, home energy efficiency standards going up to the Alberta oil sands cap is going to cost them over $1,000 a ton to implement, and the biofuels mandate uh, is coming in at over $3,000 a ton. So again, all these regulations are costing way too much at the margin. All right. So to conclude, what would I do if I could write the whole policy down? Um, first of all, for the reasons I just stated, we need to clear the decks, remove all the current policies, and I would prefer a pricing instrument to a regulatory approach. Um, I differ from the I am approach, see the, the I am will give you this nice elegant policy ramp where the tax goes up and up and over time, but it does that by assuming away everything that makes this a complicated and uncertain issue. Um, I've worked out a, an alternative approach where you start with a very low tax rate, but it's indexed to observe temperature. And it's possible to show theoretically why that would track the unobservable optimal tax rate. But intuitively what that means is if we're not going to have much global warming, the tax rate's not going to move. And if, but if we are, if it is turning out to be a huge problem, then yeah, the tax rate will go up and people have to respond to it. So everybody basically will form an expectation of what the climate's going to do, and they'll um, get the outcome that they prefer as far as the policy. Then we add to that a futures market. And here what the, the government would have to commit to doing is auctioning off exemption certificates. Uh, a certificate exempts you from paying the tax in some year in the future. So you can buy certificates that exempt you from paying the tax 30 years from now. So then you have to decide how much am I willing to pay for that certificate? Well, what do I think the temperature is going to be 30 years from now? There would be a market for these certificates and basically the world's financial markets would become the world's most powerful climate model. So you'd then get this price path for these certificates that would not only tell you what the price of CO2 emissions should be, but it would also be a set of objective forecasts of what the climate is going to do. Now someone might look at those forecasts and if it turns out to be some sort of up and down thing like that without much of an upward trend, they might say, oh that's all wrong, I mean we know the temperature's going to go way up and, and people are ignoring all this terrible warnings of the future. In that case, great. If you've got private information that you think is credible, then go buy these permits because you're going to make a lot of money off of this. So you don't need to argue about who's right on the science and all that. You just put your money where your mouth is and, and invest in the market. More formally, I can show, I, I do this with a colleague, we've shown that this trading process would actually yield objective forecasts of the climate that would use all available information. And as far as I know, it's the only mechanism anyone's proposed that would do this, that would solve all these problems of politicization in the science process. You just look at the, what the market's telling you, and that's the best information you'd have on what the climate's going to do and what the, pri the price of emissions should be. So, uh, wrapping up, in the real world, the social cost of carbon is never the appropriate rate to use for tax or regulatory analysis. It always has to be adjusted in, in some important ways. The social cost of carbon needs to exceed a threshold for tax or regulations to yield a net benefit, but this is unlikely given the, the policies that are proposed, especially when we deal with the empirical climate sensitivity issue. And I would like to see us harness the market to yield a mechanism for unbiased climate forecasting. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Creating a model Creating a model that actually is linked to temperature, that kind of defeats the purpose, though. As what Otmar Edenhofer said, it's climate policy is about redistributing the world's wealth. Does, how's that going to be achieved if you actually try to create something that's coming up the works? Anyway, uh, I, we at this point have come to the uh, time where we will accept questions from the audience. Uh, do we have a microphone? Yes, we do. Uh, so we'll 
let them pick it out. And please tell us who you are and address your question to one of our panelists. Uh, I am Francis Menton of the Manhattan Contrarian website. Um, I can't believe that all three of you seem to take the social cost of carbon thing seriously <laughs> and then tweak it here and there. Isn't warm better? Doesn't carbon dioxide fertilize? Isn't this whole thing total bullshit? Please comment. <laughs> um, uh, any takers? <laughs> We're pretty clear that if, if the, the climate warms, some parts of the world will get better. Canada's going to do Canada. much better. Canada. Okay, Canada's going to do much better yeah. if it turns out that, that uh, the, the climate warms. But if you're already near the equator, you already are in part of the planet that's very hot, and any increase in temperature there is going to cause damages. So even today, if climate changes, it's pretty obvious that uh, warming is, is, has potential damages associated with it. Now, it's also true that CO2 is, is beneficial. Say that again? More than getting electricity when they don't have it because they don't get the equation? Well, the, the question is, if there's damages associated with, with uh, warming, does that mean we'll have no electricity? That's, those two things don't mean one another. Um, it turns out that if, you're, if you think there are small damages associated with climate change, you, you try to opt for less carbon intensive electricity. It doesn't mean you, don't, you opt for no electricity. Kevin or Ross, do you want to? Yeah, I was just um, picking up on that point. I, I mentioned at the beginning the, the social cost of carbon. I would prefer to use the marginal damages of CO2 emissions, but that takes too long. Um, the SCC, it's never a number you use on its own. So using the example of the third world and electricity, uh, I think it's terrible that the World Bank tried to stop funding for the Madupi power plant in southern Africa on the grounds that it would release CO2 emissions. They need the electricity, and any reasonable cost-benefit analysis would show that building that power plant and expanding their power production facilities would, would yield benefits vastly outweighing anything that we might associate with the, uh, the CO2 emissions. So, I think your concern there is that people misuse um, the concepts or they, they try to say that social cost of carbon is, is a positive number, therefore we shouldn't build power plants. And I mean, that's uh, just faulty logic. Um, taking the concept seriously, there are some things that you can take seriously in, as a concept, even though you know that you'll never really be able to put a, a, a precise number to it. And, um, but it still helps clarify your thinking on the issue, and that's how I approach this. Well, I was just going to point out that under one of the three models, the SEC can actually be negative, suggesting that carbon dioxide emissions are actually a good thing for the planet. The policy implication there would be that one shouldn't be taxing carbon dioxide emissions, but subsidizing it instead. So, yeah. And I think it's important to note that by them engaging, I mean, that is where the debate is in many, having gone to UN meetings, gone to other places, that this is where the debate's at. So having experts that can talk the language look at the models and answer them is extremely helpful, even if it, in many cases, may be garbage, according to many of us. Uh, uh, Nick? Yeah. Can I get to go? Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask the question, what would you guys do if, in fact, there was now scientific proof that there was absolutely no uh, impact of carbon dioxide on warming? That was going to be my question. In the last session, there was actually some discussion that there's not that much uh, uh, research dollars that goes into the climate, uh, you know, the other end of the climate. It's only the warming end. I happen to have uh, I'm an independent uh, science researcher myself, Carl Zeller and Ned Nikoloff. I do have a handout to give you, and we do have. It's brand new. It, uh, it avoids all the modelings that's been done uh, radiatively. This has an entirely different uh, phenomenal look at climate change, and I can tell you there is no impact of carbon dioxide, so all three of you are wasting your time. <laughs> Come work for me. <laughs> all right. I don't know as though that was a question, but... Uh, <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Who has a microphone here? Uh, I, I can so, answer that a little bit. Oh, you, you want to try to... Okay. Yeah, what would they do? What would you do if all of a sudden, in fact, 
you know, I'm saying this is real, and what if it was? Yeah, okay. So I know it is. We, we do know that carbon dioxide is beneficial to plants, uh, that if, if plants had to vote for this, they'd vote for a more greenhouse gases, more CO2 in the atmosphere, because uh, they will, in fact, that's helpful to their growth. They'll grow faster, and they'll, they'll prosper. So if, if there was no warming consequence, we would look at, at the CO2 benefits associated with that. You'd also still have acidification of the oceans, which is going to be harmful eventually to, to uh, wildlife in, in the oceans. That would slow you down a little bit, but I think probably the benefits on terrestrial ecosystems is so great that you'd, you would get more CO2 in the atmosphere. You'd vote for it. You'd subsidize it. Um, I showed you what I would do, which, uh, which if it turns out you're right, what it would mean is basically you end up with no policy into the perpetual future. But I wouldn't want to put a policy in place that on the basis of the assumption that I know what the future is going to be for the climate or that is somehow contingent on my opinion about the science. And so the mechanism I propose, it doesn't actually depend in any way on my view of the science or any one individual's view. And hopefully it would, uh, uh, it would sound like your expectation because um, then that would avoid a lot of problems. All right. Okay. Well, we have another question. Coalition. Uh, Can you repeat uh, that, please? Yeah, my name is Mark Carr, and I uh, help the CO2 Coalition from time to time. Kevin, on uh, your point about not being able to use a model because of the co-authorship and things like that, isn't there uh, like a fair use type of uh, parallel in, uh, in, in the work that you do that uh, allows you to uh, run the person's model Acknowledging that, that it's their creative work, but like, hey, we're critiquing this by running it. We're not, we're not playing along with authorship and, and the, the capacity to reject uh, the publication. Is, is there no fair use type of thing in your universe there? I'm sorry, so I guess I don't understand the question. Regarding the three models. <laughs> and I, the one you didn't run yeah, because so you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, give an honest appraisal without the guy's permission. Well, the thing questions. is, he wouldn't give us the codes. So regarding the three models, I contacted the EPA for the, mo for the computer codes, and they gave me the DICE codes. The fun model codes you can download from github.com, and then they give some specific instructions to modify them to replicate their results. For the page model, they give us some instructions, but they also say you have to contact Chris Hope for the codes, and he refused to give them to us unless we we allowed him to be a co-author on anything we published. All right. We have another question. Well, first of all, just one statement. Uh, who, who decides what, how much is taxed and who gets the money uh, on a global basis, which it seems to me is uh, unsolvable. But more importantly, what about attribution? Shouldn't the, my name is Steve Hines, I'm sorry, the word merchant. Um, Shouldn't we be giving, as far as attribution, the, co the countries that are emitting the most get the largest tax so that they, in fact, reduce their consumption or their emission? Uh, no, that, um, well, a country that has the largest emissions, since that, they'd have the largest tax base, so they'd be paying the most in that sense. But not necessarily they, would they have the largest tax rate, because it depends on um, the marginal cost of public funds in their country. Um, so it, uh, if everyone paid the same, the same tax rate, then yeah, the country with the most emissions pays the most in taxes. Leo, uh, Leo Goldstein from defytriplec.com. A question to uh, Robert uh, Mendelssohn. Uh, what's so wrong with Yale University? Why in the 30s it was on the far front of uh, eugenics? Now it is on the far front of uh, climate alarmism. So what's so wrong with it? Thank you. It's, it's the uh, leading university in philosophy. <laughs> That's what's wrong. <laughs> says it all. <laughs> all right, next is... Again, identify yourself, please. I'm uh, Dave Burton, and I have a website called sealevel.info, sealevel.info. Uh, I have a question for Dr. McKittrick. Um, that's a really interesting 
proposal you had there, but uh, uh, an objection comes to mind, and, and perhaps you'll uh, address it. Um, the, it seems that people tend to find what they're looking for, and there's a, there's a strong incentive already amongst most of the climate science community um, to find more warming. It seems like your system would uh, attach a lot of dollar movement to um, uh, the uh, published estimates of, of temperature. And you already, if you look at these di different temperature indices, uh, they vary pretty substantially. And if we put incentives in place for, for, uh, for those things uh, to go one way or another, depending on your, you know, <laughs> it, it seems like a problem. It seems like a, p a potential um, unintended side effect. Um, and uh, I don't know what you would do with, uh, about that. I mean, I, it comes to mind maybe we should, uh, you should index to sea level instead, uh, sea level rise instead of temperature because the, the tide gauge numbers are a lot more trustworthy, I think, than the temperature numbers. But people combine those tide gauge numbers and come up with indices that are also uh, uh, quite questionable and they use worse stuff with satellites. So yeah. you got a um, way to address that concern. So first of all, Dave, thank you for sea level.info. If the rest of you don't know about it, it's a fantastic website and uh, you should take a look. Um, yeah, the temperature index has to be objective, non-manipulable. I would suggest it should be based on satellite readings. Uh, just avoid all the crap with the surface temperature adjustments. I don't think there's any saving the surface temperature network. I've published lots of papers using that data and uh, it's just, uh, you never hit bottom as far as what the real numbers are. I think it's possible though on a going forward basis to improve the satellite system so we don't have these gaps in the record when one satellite goes out and another one comes in. That's where the disagreements are about how to calibrate the, the, and splice the series together. So if you had redundant satellites so we don't have these calibration problems, then you could have a, 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 an objective non-manipulable series measuring the part of the atmosphere that we're actually interested in. Uh, that's how I would resolve that problem. This this will be the last question back here. Uh, <coughs> Bill, Lindquist, uh, Bill Lindquist is my name. Uh, if during the years and decades ahead the globe could conceivably cool, not warm, could you experts there on the panel justify coming up with a negative cost of carbon so that I'm encouraged and paid to pump out every incremental ton of CO2 that I could manage? Actually, Yes, I'm, I'm actually very concerned in the long run that the planet's going to cool because the average temperature on the Earth is about five degrees colder than today. And frankly, a world that's five degrees colder than today is, would be very unpleasant for a place like the United States. Um, so in, in the very long run, you get out of this little 20,000 year warming period we're in, uh, we're going to face much colder temperatures. And I, I think those are going to be just as dangerous, just as risky as, as going to very high temperatures. Um, now, exactly how you'd actually um, do that, whether you want to hold on to your CO2 and wait till it gets colder and use it then, <laughs> or, or whether you want to spend it now and just hope it just sits up there in the atmosphere for a long time, uh, that, that I'm not sure I know the science of that. But, but that's, that's in the long run, actually, cooling is in our future. And that's, that's, that's a danger that we're going to face. So these models, in principle, if you had an equilibrium climate sensitivity distribution under such a scenario, you could put that into these models to determine that, and you would get probably a negative social cost of carbon. Even under the ECS distributions that are more up to date, you get that. But then the bottom line is, even if you know, there is a negative SCC, I'm not sure anybody would, be, anybody would be wanting regulators and bureaucrats to be telling them how to pump CO2 into the atmosphere, yeah. right? Yes, uh, five degrees cooler. That would be like living in Canada. <laughs> that would be terrible. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for being here at our panel, and uh, appreciate you uh, for give a round of applause for our panelists, and thank you for coming. Hello, everybody. There'll be a half hour break uh, before lunch, and then lunch will be served next door. So you got uh, you're free till 12:30 until lunch.
you have to land here. That would be worth it. Or you have to on the tropical side. And if we take the model seriously, the only thing that would explain a warming of the tropical side is the warming trend would be increased greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. We do need to find a measurement that is going to take the place of the singularly responsible greenhouse gas emissions, but not actually looking at the economic evolution of the solar
funny that well they do you know what they're they're saving their powder for the the big climate march in April. That's when they're gonna get the the leaders. Yeah. They can't they're doing a group climate I don't know, there's like a scientist march and then there's the three fifty dot org march and then Yeah, but they they decided that they were going so so it is Craig, Dennis, then you? That is correct. Okay. PowerPoint flash drive. All right, I think we're going to get started here. All right, everybody, welcome back. Thank you for being here. Give yourselves a big round of applause for choosing this room instead of the polar bear room. Uh, don't get up and leave, please. Um, but no, thank you guys for all making the trip to Washington, wherever you guys are from. Uh, my name is Isaac Orr. I'm a research fellow at the Heartland Institute, and we have a really good program today. Uh, out of all the panels I'm moderating, this is the one I was looking forward to the most. So we have a really good list of speakers here that are going to be talking about fossil fuels and peace. So maybe, you know, when it came to the Obama administration, we should have told them, like, hey, man, give peace a chance. Um, so uh, we have Craig Idso, who will be starting. Uh, he's going to talk about... Uh, food production and conflict. Then we're going to have Dennis Avery come up here, and his talk is going to be on the connection between the climate and conflicts, especially when it comes to past empires uh, rising or falling based on the temperature. And lastly, we're going to have Aaron Stover, also of the Heartland Institute, a good friend of mine, and he's going to uh, examine claims that global warming will lead to more conflict in the future. So without further ado, these guys know themselves better than I do, so they can give bios about uh, about themselves if they want to elaborate a little bit more. But let's give a big round of applause for our speakers today. All right, thank you. Do you have the, the clicker? Clicker. Perfect. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm excited to be here today to participate on this panel. Uh, I want to thank the Heartland Institute once again for inviting me to speak and for all the incredible work that they're doing in this uh, fight over or against climate alarmism. I truly applaud and appreciate their efforts. They're a wonderful organization and have made a significant difference in the critical battle over what to do or not do about rising anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Well, as you are aware, the topic of our, our current panel is fossil fuels and world peace. And for my presentation, I've been asked to highlight the historical relationship between carbon dioxide climate and social conflict. In prefacing my remarks, I would like to note that many political and opinion leaders feel it is important to enact legislation to limit carbon dioxide emissions out of concern that global warming is detrimental to society. High among their list of anxieties is the fear that CO2-induced global warming will lead to social unrest and perhaps even war. Primarily as a result of postulated reductions in agricultural output followed by population turmoil due to lack of food. However, an emerging body of research uh, suggests that these concerns are not only unfounded, but almost always backwards. It is global cooling from which society stands the most to lose. Global warming, by contrast, tends to promote social stability, as evidenced by the findings of multiple peer-reviewed papers, some of which I will discuss with you here today. Now, China is a good test case to begin highlighting this relationship between global warming and social stability because it has a well-populated, primarily agricultural country for, mill for millennia, and it has a relatively well-recorded history over this time period. Accordingly, several researchers have conducted analyses of factors influencing social stability in this part of the world. In a study of the widespread crises in China, over the period 1600 to 1899, Li and Zhang, for example, found that both natural calamities and human catastrophes were clustered in periods of cold climate, primarily because cooling generates a devastating impact on agricultural production. Indeed, as shown in this slide, natural calamities and human catastrophes peaked during the colder climates of the 17th and 19th centuries, whereas during the relatively warm 18th century, agricultural production was enhanced, famines were abated, 
Wars, rebellions, and epidemics were minimal, and population growth surged. Covering a broader temporal range of analysis, Zhang et al. compared proxy climate records with historical data of Chinese wars, social unrest, and dynastic transitions from the mid-9th through the early 20th century and found similar results. War frequencies, peak war clusters, nationwide periods of social unrest, and dynastic transitions were all significantly associated with cold, not warm, phases of China's oscillating climate. More specifically, they report that all three distinctive peak war clusters, defined as more than 50 wars in a 10-year period, occurred during cold climate phases, as did all seven periods of nationwide social unrest and nearly 90% of all dynastic changes that decimated this largely agrar agrarian society. Thus, they conclude that climate change was one of the most important factors in determining the dynastic cycle and alteration of war and peace in ancient China, with warmer climates having been intensely more effective than cooler climates in terms of helping to keep the peace. And China is no different from the rest of the world in this regard. Focusing on the whole of Europe, for example, Toll and Wagner observed that periods with low temperatures in the pre-industrial era were accompanied by violent conflicts. Field and Lapp report that fortification construction is significantly correlated with periods of cooling throughout the inhabited regions of the tropical Pacific. Periods of warmth, in contrast, generally correlate with more peaceful times and epochs of less warfare. And studying the African Sahel, Benjaminson et al. Uh, say that comparison of climate and conflict data gives little substance to claims that climate variability is an important driver of these conflicts which finding they ultimately concluded presents evidence that land use conflicts in this region are shaped by political and economic factors as opposed to climate variability. Additional evidence that global cooling is far more prone to cause civil strife than global warming comes from the study of Kobe et al. Analyzing data from all countries of the world over the recent 1980 to 2004 time period, the team of four researchers report that climate variability measured as deviations in temperature and precipitation from their past does not affect violent intrastate conflict. In commenting on this finding, they say it is important because the causal pathway leading from climate variability via deteriorating economic growth to conflict is a key part of most theoretical models of the climate conflict nexus. Similar results were obtained by Zhang et al who performed time series analyses to examine the association between temperature change and population collapses in different, regions, in different regions and climatic zones of the Northern Hemisphere, focusing on all known population collapses over the period 800 to 1900 AD. In addition, they, compared, or they computed regressions to estimate the relative sensitivity of population growth in the Northern Hemisphere to climatic change, where the independent variables employed were time and temperature anomalies. Well, their results indicate that of the 88 northern hemisphere population collapses identified, fully 80% of them were caused by cooling, while 12% occurred during what the six scientists called mild conditions, and only 8% of them were caused by warming. Thus, for the northern hemisphere as a whole, it is no surprise that they discovered temperature was positive and highly significant in the regressions in which a 10% increase in temperature produced an average of 3.1% of increase in population growth rate. In another large-scale study, Sletbeck examined whether natural disasters can add explanatory power to an established model of civil conflict. Results indicated that they can, but that their effect of conflict is the opposite of popular perception. That is to say, Sletbeck specifies Quote, to the extent that climate-related natural disasters affect risk of conflict, they contribute to reducing it, end quote. And this result holds for a measure of climate-related natural disasters in general, as well as drought in particular, which findings they say are consistent with a large amount of research on the relation between disasters and the risk of antisocial behavior, stretching all the way back to the work of Fritz conducted in 1961. Lastly, I want to highlight the work of Gartsky, who explored the relationship between interstate conflict, climate change, and processes fueled by industrialization, such as development, democracy, and international institutions. 
Based on his analysis, Gartsky's work further confirms that global warming is associated with a reduction in interstate conflict. What is more, he, he notes that incorporating measures of development, democracy, cross-border trade, and international institutions reveals that systemic trends towards peace are actually best accounted for by the increase in international income, which in turn is driven by the processes that are widely seen by experts as responsible for global warming. Now, how ironic is that? Did you see the irony? Recognizing as much, Gartsky continues by writing that stagnating economic development and middle income states caused by efforts to combat climate change could actually realize fears of climate-induced warfare. And thus he concludes that we must add to the advantages of economic development as it appears to make countries more peaceful. And we must therefore ask ourselves if environmental objectives should be modified by the prospect that combating climate change could prolong the process of transition from warlike to peaceful polities. Now, considering the findings presented in each of these studies I just cited, plus those revealed in a number of other studies not discussed here, but which you can find and read about on my CO2 Science website, in our subject index under the topic, topical heading of war and social unrest, it is clear that concerns over, over potential future increases in civil strife due to CO2-induced global warming are unsupported in the scientific literature. In fact, empirical data confirm that the reality is just the opposite of the climate alarmist projections. What is more, ironically, there are legitimate reasons to conclude that rising atmospheric CO2 will actually help to alleviate social unrest in the future. So how will that be accomplished? Well, the answer starts with an op-ed published by Jimmy Carter a number of years ago entitled, To Cultivate Peace, We Must First Cultivate Food. Therein, the former U.S. president wrote, when the Cold War ended in 1989, we expected an era of peace, but instead we got a decade of war. And then asking why peace had been so elusive, he answered that most of the past century's wars were fueled by poverty in developing countries whose economies depend on agriculture, but which lack the means to make their farmland productive. This fact, he continued, suggests an obvious but often overlooked path to peace, which is raise the standard of living of the millions of rural people who live in poverty by increasing agricultural productivity. His argument being that thriving agriculture is the engine that fuels broader economic growth and development, thus paving the way for prosperity and peace. One way to boost agricultural production and thereby promote the cause of peace is to fertilize the atmosphere with carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide, one of the major end products of the combustion process that fuels the engines of industry and transportation, is the very elixir of life. It is the major building block of all plant tissues, playing an essential role in the photosynthetic process that sustains nearly all of Earth's vegetation, which in turn sustains nearly all of the planet's animal life. And as with any production process, the insertion of more raw materials, in this case CO2, into the production line results in more manufactured goods coming out of the other end, which, is, which in the case of the plant growth production line is biosphere sustaining food. And as President Carter stated in his op-ed, leaders of developing nations must make food security a priority, for there can be no peace until people have enough to eat, thus allowing the CO2 content of the air to increase so as to boost agricultural production is one method by which that objective can be achieved. Within this context, a few years ago, I developed an, uh, and analyzed a study of supply and demand of food scenario for the year 2050. More specifically, I prepared estimates of regional and global food supplies derived for the year 2050, both including and not including the well-known yield-enhancing effects of rising atmospheric CO2 on food plants. That is expected to occur over the next few decades. And I then compared the, those results with the food needs of the human population that is, is expected to be inhabiting the planet at that future date. This exercise revealed that a very real and devastating food crisis is looming on the horizon, and that continuing advancements in agricultural technology and expertise will most likely not be able to bridge the gap between global food supply and global food demand just a few short years from now. However, the positive impact of Earth's rising atmospheric CO2 concentration on crop yields will considerably lessen the severity of the coming food shortage. 
in some regions and countries, it will mean the very difference between being food secure and food insecure. And it will aid in lifting untold hundreds of millions out of a state of hunger and malnutrition, preventing starvation and premature death. Now, those findings suggest that the world's food security envisioned by President Carter is precariously dependent upon the continued rising of the air's CO2 concentration. And the benefits of that rise have been aptly characterized by the leader of modern-day crop CO2 enrichment research, Dr. Sylvan H. Whitwer, who stated, The rising level of atmospheric CO2 could be the one global natural resource that is progressively increasing food production and total biological output in a world of otherwise diminishing natural resources of land, water, energy, minerals, and fertilizer. It is a means of inadvertently increasing the productivity of farming systems and other photosynthetically active ecosystems. The effects know no boundaries, and both developing and developed countries are and will be sharing equally. Well, Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution and 1970 Nobel Peace Prize recipient, has also written about the need to vastly increase the world's agricultural productivity. In an article he published at the turn of the 21st century, he described the very real problem of food shortages facing the world in the not-too-distant so, not future, noting it took some 10,000 years to expand food production to the current level of about 5 billion tons per year. And in order to meet the needs of the growing population of the planet, we will have to nearly double the current production again within a very few short decades. However, Dr. Borlaug saw some ominous forces at work that could keep society from achieving that goal, specifically citing those that array themselves against the genetic engineering of agricultural crops. Extremists in the environmental movement, he wrote, seem to be doing everything they can to stop scientific progress in its tracks, stating that the platform of the anti-biotechnology ex uh, extremists, if it, if it were to be adopted, would have grievous consequences for both the environment and humanity. In addition, he lamented the fact that some scientists, many of whom should or do know better, have also jumped on the extremist environmental bandwagon in search of research funds. What is striking about Dr. Borlaug's words is how well they also describe the situation faced with respect to the ongoing rise in the air's CO2 concentration. He talked, for example, about the unsubstantiated scaremongering done by opponents of genetic engineering, which is amazingly similar to the unsubstantiated scaremongering done by climate alarmists who would deny the world the incredible agricultural benefits of the aerial fertilization effect of atmospheric CO2. Nowhere, Dr. Borlaug wrote, is it more important for knowledge to confront fear born of ignorance than in the production of food. It is disappointing that this agricultural aspect of the global change debate is almost never broached. As Dr. Borlaug states, agricultural scientists and leaders have a moral obligation to warn political, educational, and religious leaders about the magnitude and seriousness of the arable land, food, and population problems that lie ahead, even with breakthroughs in biotechnology. In fact, if we fail to do so, as he described it, we will be negligent in our duty of inad and inadvertently may be contributing to the pending chaos of incalculable millions of deaths by starvation. Imagine the civil strife and conflict that would follow. Global food insecurity will not disappear without new technology, Borlaug concluded. And as I have shown in my own study of the subject, it will be next to impossible to meet the, the challenge of feeding Earth's population just a few short decades from now without a continuation of the ongoing rise in the air's CO2 content, which rise will thankfully boost agricultural production and foster global food security, thus helping to pave the way for future global prosperity and peace. CO2 induced global warming is not leading, nor will it lead, to increased incidences of social unrest and war. Rather, future warming, if it is to occur, in conjunction with the very real and measurable benefits expected by continuing atmospheric CO2 enrichment, will help to foster social stability and peace. And it is time for the true deniers to wake up and face the facts. For far too long now, they have besmirched and defamed the many virtues of carbon dioxide. Atmospheric CO2 is not a pollutant, it is the very elixir of life. Thank you. They tell me if I stand on this X, I'll be able to see the screen and still talk and have you hear me. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? 
few years ago, I wrote with Fred Singer a book called Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years. The Dansgaard Oeschger climate cycle that moved from global warmings to global coolings in a long natural pattern. We haven't known why that pattern occurred, but we knew that it did. And after I finished that book, I began to wonder what happened to all those ancient cultures that collapsed? And when I started looking, I discovered they all collapsed. And I'd like to share with you today some of the details on how they collapsed and the impact that it produced. But the theme is war in the cold. These are ancient Chinese warriors. No nation has had more wars and rebellions than China because it's vulnerable. Its food production is especially vulnerable to climate changes. This is the Thirty Years' War in Europe in the early 1600s when Protestants were fighting with Christians about who had the correct understanding of God's will. 11 million people were killed in that Christian conflict. This is Napoleon's army trying to retreat from Moscow in one of the worst winters in all history. I think something like 1,800 of his troops got back to Paris after that winter. All of these wars occurred during little ice ages. Most of the ancient conflicts occurred during little ice ages. Why? Shorter growing seasons, cloudier skies, untimely frosts, extended droughts as much as 350 years, without rain in a region. When you've had that long a drought, if you get rain, then you get a flood. Noah's flood occurred in Mesopotamia about 2900 BC. The heavier floods drown farmers in their fields. This pattern creates crop failure across continents and around the world. They couldn't feed their cities, and often you got war as a result. I'm having trouble seeing this, yeah. Oh, just about, yeah. 80% uh, of China's tumultuous wars occurred in its little ice ages. Uh, one of the cute things was locusts. We've discovered recently that locusts love a pattern of alternating droughts and floods. It's a complex biological thing, but it produces more locust damage, and that's China's most destructive insect. Epidemics. The bubonic plague always occurred during droughts because the fleas live on the rats and voles out in the Chinese West Grand grasslands. When there's a drought out there, all the rodents die and all those fleas are looking for new hosts. And they're spread by traders and trading ships and it goes worldwide. When people can't eat, they're unhappy, more likely to have rebellion, and very often invasions. China in the cold, 1600 to 1899, that's almost a thousand years. 243 wars, 267 rebellions, 81 major floods and droughts, and 40 natural calamities, including typhoons, epidemics, and maunder minimums. Deadly. Let's look at Europe's war peak in the 17th century. 
the Thirty Years' War, 11 million deaths, nothing resolved. Finally, both sides agreed to coexist with each other. But look at this chart of food prices in the Netherlands from 1200 to 1900. You see a small peak there at 1300. There were four massive sea flood disasters in the Low Countries and the German coast within 40 years when the Little Ice Age began. Flooded crops, drowned people, terrible inflation in food prices, which was nothing compared to 1590 through 1610, which had the worst harvests of that whole period and drove the price of food radically higher. You can't have food prices that high without massive starvation, broad gauge famine. And then in the 1800s, we had another solar minimum and we had, that was the Dalton. You had very cold weather, unstable weather. Europe in the 17th century general crisis, the Thirty Years' War, as I've said, trampling armies, fleeing farmers, displaced people. And Europe also in that period got the Black Death. It had begun in the 1500s, but it spilled over into the 1600s. Killed 30 to 60% of Europe's population over three centuries. As I mentioned, that always starts with drought in China, the fleas coming west to spread death through Europe, and we had a series of major outbreaks during the 17th century. Bubonic plague victims, no treatment, no prevention, nothing but wailing. In China, the population dropped 43%. Again, this is the 17th century. 1620 to 1650, extreme cold, floods, famines, wars, rebellions, and blue bubonic plague. Chinese famine victims getting the small amount of food aid the government had to pass out. Global war peak in the 19th century began with the Napoleonic Wars from 1804 to 1813. Death toll four to six million major rebellions, of course, across Europe in the famine times. The Crimean War involved four major countries. These are the British troops waiting for the charge of Napoleon's Grand Army. As was mentioned in this morning's program next door, we have finally gotten the human food supply past most of nature's quirks. We began the technological revolution in farming during the Little Ice Age. During the second half of the Little Ice Age, we traded crops and livestock around the world. Almost every country got better food productivity as a result. And that technology, the search for farming technologies that began then, crop rotation, better plows, so forth, carried on through until today. And I had the pleasure of working with Norman Borlaug toward the close of his career when he was trying to bring a green revolution to Africa. Never achieved that, but the search was an important beginning. Now, as Craig has just pointed out, we aren't done yet. We're going to have to nearly double world food production again before the population decline 
begins about 2060. We're predicting 8 billion people by 2100, perhaps 3 billion people by 2300, because richer people have fewer children because their children don't die. But we have to get through that peak food demand period, biotechnology, CO2, whatever else we can get. But our last wars were fought not over food, but over energy. Japan wanted the oil from Java, and they took it. Germany wanted to annex the oil fields of Romania, and they took them. But they wasted the treasure and the blood because they failed. And free trade today makes it possible for people to count on being able to buy what they can't produce. And that free trade must be ensured along with our continued progress in agricultural research. Thank you. Oh, well, oh, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my remarks today will focus on the current and future military and geopolitical implications of global warming. Uh, is climate change currently posing a threat to military readiness? Is it likely to in the future? Is it increasing the likelihood of conflicts that will lead to military battles or even war? A review of available research and data suggests the answer to each question is no. Climate and weather are just two of many variables that have always affected military planning and conflicts. Given what we know about the causes, pace of, and consequences of modern day climate change, there's no reason to believe it poses a major problem today. <clears throat> Following recent Senate testimony during his confirmation for Secretary of Defense, General James Mattis was asked to respond in writing to questions by Senate Democrats about climate change and national security. He replied, climate change is impacting stability in areas of the world where our troops are operating today. It is appropriate for the combatant commands to incorporate drivers of instability that impact the security environment in their areas, in their areas into their planning. Later in his remarks, he added, I agree the, that the effects of a changing climate such as increased maritime access to the Arctic, rising sea levels, desertification, among others, impact our security situation. I will ensure that the department continues to be prepared to conduct operations today and in the future, and that we are prepared to address the effects of a climate change, changing climate on our threat assessments, resources, and readiness. The left-leaning media outlet ProPublica uh, reported that Secretary Mattis' remarks may be a sign of breaking ranks with the Trump administration on the issue of climate change as a national priority. But when analyzing the remarks carefully, consider if the same question had been asked 10, 20, or even 50 years ago when carbon dioxide levels were far lower, would the answer be any different? Military planners have a duty to consider all contingencies, and a changing climate is and always has been one of them. Further, Mattis' remarks make no reference to humans as the cause of climate change, nor mention uh, fossil fuels or carbon dioxide. <clears throat> A 2015 White House assessment on the national security implications of climate change stated, a changing climate will act as an accelerant of instability around the world, exacerbating tensions relating to water scarcity and food shortages, natural resource com competition, underdevelopment, and overpopulation. Climate change is a threat multiplier that will aggravate stressors abroad such as poverty, environmental degradation, political instability, and social tensions, conditions that enable terrorist activity and other forms of violence. The risk of conflict may increase. Given that the, this is the rationale for new policy, we should analyze the premises and their sources. The claims of severe climate threats are based on computer climate models of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. And as Heartland speakers at this and previous conferences have noted many times, uh, and uh, as we saw Pat Michaels demolished uh, them uh, during the lunch keynote, the temperature projections have been greatly overstated and therefore the models are unreliable. 
This line of reasoning asks that we accept a series of premises each dependent on the prior one, namely that temperatures are rising at a dangerously unprecedented rate, that this is caused by human activity primarily from fossil fuel combustion, that such rise in temperature will trigger severe weather events, and most relevant to this discussion, these events will create instability in numerous areas so as to increase threats to national security. The main flaw as it relates to national security is that they assume causality between climate change and instability when there's very little evidence of such from the body of academic literature that has emerged on the subject. Furthermore, the case studies that are advancing the climate conflict theory suffer from numerous methodolo methodological errors. For example, they use untestable methods that, uh, models that confuse dependent variables. Uh, there's a lack of control groups in the case studies. Uh, reverse causality, such as when ongoing conflicts damage the environment and create resource sca scarcity rather than environmentally determined conflict. Uh, and an over-reliance on speculating on future conflicts rather than finding empirical evidence for their claim. I will now examine five sources of conflict allegedly resulting from climate change. Water, famine, resource scarcity, refugee flows, and the Arctic region. A review of several academic studies on these issues shows that there's very tenuous support for, the, for their claims. Water is one of the most widely cited sources for conflict in the cases linking climate change with national security, whether it be due to floods, droughts, or other shortages, or poor water quality. The previous administration argued that these problems are a threat to U.S. bases and installations here and abroad. Professor Aaron Wolf conducted a study of 412 conflicts between 1918 and 1994 and only found seven where water was even a partial cause. He wrote, as near we can find, there has never been a single war fought over water. Numerous other recent studies have yielded similar results, concluding that ethnic and political causes of conflict are most common. This should actually come as little surprise when we consider water as a shared re resource that easily fro flows across borders. It is exceedingly difficult to control water supplies, and the economic incentives for those downstream and upstream are far greater to cooperate rather than enter into conflict, and there are countless examples of long-standing treaties and agreements between political groups concerning water resources and borders. In 2012, a group of academics tested climate change scenarios regarding water resources in in and Israeli-Palestinian relations. They noted an unintended consequence of the climate, change, con climate conflict theory in that, ironically, quote, ironically, the climate security literature may do more to militarize environmental crises by characterizing them as security challenges and thereby prompting decision makers to turn from cooperative or diplomatic solutions and towards military options, close quote. Introducing this new context in an unstable situation may actually worsen it. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry. I, went ahead there, but uh, researchers have also looked at specific cases in Central Asia and throughout Africa and found little evidence suggesting future conflicts arising from water usage. Uh, now as I've uh, uh, shown on this slide, famine is another climate variable suggested as a source for war. The immediate fact to consider is that we are living in an age of record food production thanks to amazing technological innovations in the past century with crop yields rising across a wide range of commodities. Climate alarmists warn that rising temperatures and water shortages from climate change will reduce crop yields, yet we see no evidence of this happening. Furthermore, this ignores several key points. Technology has allowed us to expand food production at unprecedented rates, so why wouldn't we expect technology to adapt agricultural practices to a changing climate? Secondly, as my colleague Craig Itso just elaborated, carbon dioxide is plant food. There's n far more evidence suggesting that an increase in carbon dioxide will result in a greening of the planet rather than crop failures and food shortages, and should we experience a warming climate, it will increase the amount of arable land. Lastly, the very policies being promoted to lower greenhouse gas emissions would be a major hindrance to food production due to higher energy prices. Modern agricultural prices, uh, processes rely heavily on fossil fuels, and many fertilizers and pesticides are petroleum-based. <clears throat> on the subject of affordable energy, a 2005 report by the U.S. Agency for International Development found direct links between cheap energy, economic growth, and stability. Surveying 93 countries, the researchers observed that access to affordable energy and economic growth increased the odds of peace by a factor of 2.5, and an increase in energy consumption raises the, the probability for stability by a factor of 1.5. This clearly supports the argument that to achieve peace and security, we should be pursuing po policies that aim to lower energy prices, not increase them. 
The original factor advanced in the climate conflict hypothesis is resource scarcity, with the notion that an environment degraded by climate change will result in instability and conflict as nations fight over a diminishing resource base. Independent of climate change, this is not a new theory, and although scholars have found limited examples of conflict over mineral resources when other factors are involved, a 2011 study concluded that, in modern times, no interstate conflicts have been driven by depletion of mineral resources. Uh, as we've seen in our previous examples, the same arguments hold true. Uh, thanks largely to technological innovation and market forces, we've witnessed unparalleled food production and improvements in resource extraction technology, such as the recent boom in hydraulic fracturing. Advances in inter international trade have greatly improved global supply chains to move commodities where they are needed. Many of these claims are based on the same discredited Malthusian predictions, such as the peak oil scare in recent years, and the claims in the 1970s book, Limits to Growth, that the supply of most commodity metals and minerals be, would be depleted by the past decade or two. And again, as we saw with water, academic studies have found that cooperation is far more likely than conflict in the case of resource scarcity. War is very expensive and highly unpredictable. Gains from trade and cooperation should be clear in all but the most extreme cases. We will now ex uh, consider the widely discussed yet ill-defined and theoretical concept of climate refugees as a source of conflict, which are people displaced as a result of environmental catastrophes due to climate change. The most widely cited reference to this comes from a 2009 report from the Environmental Justice Foundation predicting 150 million climate refugees by 2050. An earlier prediction that there would be 50 million climate refugees by 2010 was endorsed by the United Nations, and they were obviously mugged by reality, as we can see seven years later today. The main flaw in this argument is that it is entirely predictive and based on future speculation with empirical evidence showing that people very rarely resort to violence when faced with environmental catastrophe. <clears throat> As Dr. Bruno Bertre wrote in a 2011 Washington Quarterly article, Quote, such are the reasons why experts of environmental migrations generally agree that climate change in itself is rarely a root cause of migration. Major population displacements due to environmental and or climactic factors will remain exceptional except in the case of a sudden natural disaster. And most importantly for the sake of this analysis, they are rarely a cause of violent conflict. The Arctic is the final source of an alleged conflict claim for which again there is little support. The theory goes that melting sea ice will open new shipping lanes, creating opportunities for conflict. The first counterpoint is that the United States and Soviet Union were both operating militarily in the region throughout the Cold War with far more unstable periods than the current. Secondly, recent research has found that the defense presence in the five Arctic nations of Canada, Denmark, Norway, Russia, and the United States is territorial policing in nature, not force projection. <clears throat> Beyond the realm of academic theory, we have an actual case of climate change driven policy in the U.S. military the Navy's farm to fleet biofuels program. We must appreciate that energy is the lifeblood of our military the, in the form of gasoline, JP5 uh, yellow kerosene jet fuel, and F76, military diesel. There exists no global reservoir of alternative fuels, nor will there be for the foreseeable future. In 2011, President Obama directed the Navy to use biofuels for the sake of energy diversification. There was no efficiency, power output, or cost advantage in this decision. Following its maiden voyage, the Green Fleet came under heavy Republican scrutiny for the prohibitive cost of its 50% biofuel blend fuel, $27 per gallon versus $360 a gallon for traditional fuel. Senator McCain's office issued a report last year that found the U.S. Navy spent $58.6 million on alternative fuel between 2007 and 2014 at an average of $29.30 per gallon. The choice to spend millions of dollars in our already uh, exhausted defense budget on a ridiculously expensive fuel with no performance advantage speaks volumes about the priorities of the last administration. <clears throat> I'll uh, finish my presentation with the statement of Jeff Keeter, formerly with the George Marshall Institute, explaining why linking climate change with national security is bad policy. Quote, in summary, effort, efforts to link climate change to the deterioration of U.S. national security rely on improbable scenarios, impre imprecise and speculative methods, and scant empirical support. 
Accepting the connection can lead to the dangerous expansion of U.S. security concerns, inappropriately applied resources, and diversion of attention for more effective responses to known environmental challenges. The danger of this approach is that it offers a sense of urgency which may not be warranted, given the gaps in current state of knowledge about climate, the known flaws in the methods used to construct the scenarios on which these security scenarios are based, and confusion over the underlying causes of those security concerns." End quote. The mission of the Department of Defense is, and I quote from the uh, DOD webpage, quote, to provide the military forces needed to deter war and to protect the security of our country, end quote. Directing our military leaders to focus their attention on a highly politicized debate that ultimately rests on atmospheric carbon dioxide levels from fossil fuel emissions is the ultimate case of mission creep and sets a dangerous precedent. We should abandon this gravely misguided policy and return to the core focus of the military, protecting the nation and winning wars when we must fight them. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Oh, come on, guys. That was a golf clap. Let's do it. Let's give them a real round of applause. All right. So we're going to have a question and answer period until 345. So uh, these are my rules. This is my room. I'm the moderator. Uh, everything that you say must be phrased in the form of a question, just like Jeopardy. Uh, if you have a statement or a sermon, we're going to move on. So uh, just contact him, raise your hand. He'll come by, and you guys will get taken care of. So. There's, there's a lot of people. Uh, we will get to as many as possible. Hurry, Tim. <laughs> Having seen those uh, presentations on the social cost of carbon, how can we incorporate this component of it, since it's clearly not been, been measured in there, to uh, get a real reflection of uh, what I would call the social benefit of carbon use, carbon fuels. Well, I could, I'll speak just to the, uh, the only thing I can think of that came to my mind is, I know the EPA has somewhere a, f a figure for the value of a human life, right? So you'd have to figure out, you know, how many lives are lost by some of these wars and how many would be saved if the climate warmed by a certain degree and so forth. That'd be the only way that I know of that you could get an actual dollar value attached to promote a, a social benefit from the warming. I'm puzzled. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think our, our, we're working on the uh, uh, when you look at EPA reform and uh, what some of our previous speakers have alluded to. I think we're working on moving the model from a social cost to a social benefit. So let's all be optimistic that. Clarifying that everything you guys said here shows that everything that you said shows that carbon dioxide has been a benefit in terms of stability and and food production and all that, and yet those components seem to be absent from these calculations we saw, and I'm just saying that we got to get the ledger right here, and, and that my question was, was, you know, what are some ideas or how can we move this discussion in that direction, really? Well, I think uh, uh, Representative Lar Lamar Smith w was just talking about bad science, I mean, I, I, and I, I believe Pat Michaels made a reference to it's the sensitivity and um, uh, what's the other uh, 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 discount, rate, uh, uh, discount rate, so I, I think Getting that science right <laughs> and, and is, is the best way to go about that. And just, you know, let's, uh, let's get that on the public and uh, uh, hopefully the truth will prevail. Well, and let's recall that the last administration was dedicated to creating problems where there were none. <laughs> and we're going to pull back from that as quickly as we humanly can. Nobody was, uh, there were no grants covering this aspect of the debate um, under Obama. So if you change it, it's gonna take a change at the top and a, a new directive. Next question. <laughs> yeah, so when uh, when the next person's asking, just let Tim know that you want the next question so that way he can kind of yeah, make his your, way over there. Raise your hands while they're asking the questions, that way I know to come to you. Yep. Hi, I'm Francis Menton of Manhattan Contrarian website. Um, I, I was expecting you guys to address, but you didn't, uh, an aspect of the current situation, which is that the 
great expansion of availability of fossil fuels recently and the drop in the price has had a huge effect on world peace by putting the bad guys out of business, <laughs> like Russia, Iran, and uh, Venezuela, all dependent on high fossil fuel prices and now broke. Russia's cutting its defense budget by 25 percent right now. Can, can any of you address some of those current issues and how availability of cheap fossil fuels affects the immediate environment? Former State Department analyst, I can only agree that you've made your point very effectively. And the, the, the cheap is always, when the food is cheap, people can eat. When the, when the energy is cheap, they can go beyond eating. Dennis Avery, and that is um, your experience with uh, Fred putting a book about uh, global warming and all of the bad things that aren't happening. Your own experience with agronomy and farm kinds of things, wouldn't that make you a good candidate for giving us a booklet or a book on your experience with what things really happen when you're trying to grow food? Uh. I'm not sure that's my book. Uh, I'm, I've suddenly become a climate historian rather than agronomist. Uh, my, my question's for Aaron. Uh, I'm Clint Laird with Caesar Rodney Institute. This is tangential to your topic, but you mentioned or identified uh, alternative fuels in your presentation. Are you aware of any uh, problems you, the military has had using alternative fuels? Uh, yeah, I, I remember um, in the research, um, not, not off the top of my head, I know, I know I've come across uh, problems with I, I, wind and solar uh, just in terms of uh, grid reliability. I mean, they, they're, uh, uh, I can't think, uh, say, say anything off. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, we can talk afterwards, but in April of 2012 at Oceana Air Force uh, Naval Air Base, a jet took off, had a double flame out, and crashed, which is highly unusual. Hmm. And the speculation was given to me by a pilot that uh, they were using alternative fuels. And I tried my best to find out through political contacts and never got an answer to what fuel was in the plane. Might want to research that. Yeah, and I, and I know I've heard that uh, ethanol is, is really hard. The, the higher level of uh, uh, ethanol blend, the, the worse it is on, on engines. So that's, that uh, lends uh, proof to that. I'd worry more about the availability and the cost of the alternative fuels. One of the fuels that was being used by the Green Fleet was camel oil, a small amount of which is grown in Montana. Now, when are you going to fight this war and how much camel oil will you have in storage? What's camel oil? <laughs> <laughs> it's a crop. Okay. I think it's Middle Eastern. You talked about northern mid-latitude wars. I'm wondering about more equatorial uh, in terms of drought and effects on climate on uh, Egypt, on the Aztec Incas. I can speak to the, to the Aztec Incas and the South Sea Islands in particular. Uh, the problem for the Central Americas is not temperature change in a little ice age, but drought. And the droughts extend for centuries. And the Mayans, for example, had droughts at 400 BC, uh, massive droughts between 8 and 900 BC, and more century long droughts at 1400. And in the South Sea Islands, 
those idyllic islands got a whole lot less idyllic when the temperature dropped a full degree and the sea level in the lagoons fell three feet, ruining the fishing, and the coconut and breadfruit crops were ruined. And instead of those airy beach houses and the songs in the evening, they were up on the hillsides grubbing out a meager existence, growing taro roots, and then living in hill forts or caves where they could protect what little food store they had. It was tough. And it was warlike. I've got some lovely, I didn't use my Hawaiian war pictures, but they're pretty violent. Uh, Rick Sanders from 21st Century Science and Technology. I'm kind of surprised. It, you're all kind of, the atmosphere is kind of pessimistic because it all sounds like a zero-sum game. Nobody mentions nuclear energy, which is fantastic. We've got so, many re, so much uh, reserves in terms of thorium, uranium, nuclear fusion coming up, and everybody's saying, well, what about this, what about that? Cut the world population to three billion. I mean, come on, that's, uh, we should keep expanding our population. We've got planets to populate <laughs> and so you're, forth. You're, you're uh, fighting the demographic trend. People, when they have low death rates in their children, say, hey, two is fine. Well, if we should have three, and that will keep us expanding in any case. <laughs> but we, if we don't go to, we, uh, Kraft Erica, who brought us to the moon, he, he said we had, he wrote a book called The Territorial Imperative. We have an imperative to go to the moon and go to space because we will have fixed uh, technology. We'll, we'll run into limits with fixed technologies. But if we go to space, we'll keep growing. There are no limits to growth, just like somebody said here. That, that's, that is correct. But you're all kind of talking like we're in a fixed system and we're, we're stuck. And that's why I say we go to the future. We're going to nuclear energy. We're going to nuclear fusion. That is the future. And, and it, we, this we've is got to catch anything. up. Obama was an idiot, and he stopped us in that. But, you know, China is cranking out nuclear plants like sausages, and so are the Russians. This system is anything but stagnant. But the frontier is no longer a riverbank or a mountain range. The frontier is knowledge. And if the Chinese are extending our knowledge peacefully, that's good. And if not so peacefully, then we have to get the military in a position to cope with that. Uh, when, when Three Mile Island went, right, uh, we had, what, about 106 nuclear plants? We have under 100 now. That doesn't make any sense. And since you folks are good at pointing out... Of course it doesn't make any sense, but it's the public's will. And I've spent will. 40 years trying to influence the public's the public, will. The public and you can see how much success I've had. The, the public takes I fought the against organic farming, and I'm fighting against greenhouse alarmism. The public and, takes the cue from the media, and thank God Donald Trump's starting to ignore them. All right, next question. In the back. Uh, yeah, Steve Allen Capital Research Center. Uh, this was addressed uh, 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 tangentially, uh, talking about the uh, decision makers making bad decisions based on belief in something that's not true. Uh, regarding the uh, the threat of uh, climate change to cause all these uh, all these security problems, uh, related to that is that uh, you know you have uh, an ideology that swept the world, and you know in Europe, if you in Germany, if you learn French, uh, you learn that by repeating phrases like how you know that the West has destroyed the Earth and uh, the the poor people of the world are suffering because of it and things like this. Uh, so 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 this has been spreading around the world. It's part of Al Qaeda's ideology is that the evil capitalists have destroyed the planet. And then you have the Paris Treaty that uh, institutionalizes that that says to the poor people of the world, 
you're poorer because the wealthier countries have destroyed the environment, uh, and now we're going to give you a little bit, but we're going to give this money to like your dictators and you know your kleptocrats, uh, and then you're just going to sit there and you're going to starve. You're going to go without electricity. You're going to use uh, coal and wood burning stoves and get lung cancer and all those things because uh, we're, we're going to keep most of our stuff, but we'll give your dictator a little bit of that money in return for it. So does anyone address the the fact that this ideology has the uh, I, I think the power to destabilize, uh, to radicalize people, to promote terrorism, and so forth. Well, that's why I was talking about free trade. And I'm also talking about free financial flows. And there was speculation this morning. Uh, you know, they talked about the, the access to affluence through from the West originally and gradually spreading. And two billion people raised from abject poverty within the last 40 years and even hope that Africa will share in that opportunity increasingly in the future. I've been to Africa. The kleptocratic governments are in full sway. Uh, but that change will have to come from within the countries. We already tried colonialism and it didn't work. And now we're trying free markets and we hope they will. Anybody else? All right, yeah, I guess we'll wrap it up. Everybody, you got a 15 minute break before the next panel starts, so enjoy it. And uh, we will see you back here at 3.45. So uh, yeah, we will uh, we'll be there for the fossil fuels in human. Or this will be uh, climate politics and policy. You'll have Sam Karnick as a moderator. Jay Lair will be speaking as well as Scott Armstrong and the Honorable Dennis Headkey. So uh, yeah, we will see you in 15 minutes.
Everybody ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready as I'm ever going to be. So. I know Jay's ready. And Scott is so glib. I'm always ready. <laughs> well, that's our only screen we got there. Right, yeah. right. Um, There's, the, the, yeah, the X is right here. Right, right. But, but I'm going to have to see the screen. Yeah. I, I think it's better if I can. Can I go down there? Isn't it? Uh, yeah. We'll have to ask the audio video. Oh, okay. Because I mean, it's a quality. It's a quality thing. Of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll tr do you have a rope you could put around me? Or? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final panel of this after of this day. Uh, the first day of the conference. This uh, panel is on climate politics and policy. The story of climate policy during the past three decades, told to us through the press, the media, the culture, and our education system, which we all pay for, by the way, is an inspiring one. Intrepid, brilliant scientists discovered a grave danger to the human race, an imminent man-made global warming catastrophe. Selfless, devoted politicians took on the thankless task of informing the world of this terrifying threat to all life on Earth. Suitably well-informed voters around the world wisely gave those great statesmen and women the authority to do whatever was necessary to avert the onrushing disaster. After much deliberation and debate, the world's leaders agreed on actions that will eventually cool the globe, turn back the rising seas, and create millions of high-paying green jobs in exciting new industries. It's an inspiring story, isn't it? Unfortunately, it's almost entirely fiction. What really happened, skeptics argue, was a cynical, enormous power grab by governments, subsidy hunting and rent-seeking by businesses both big and small, the perversion of the scientific process and scholarly peer review, fierce suppression of dissent, which some of you may have experienced, and a rush to implement policies which are almost guaranteed to fail and are based not on facts, but on models that assume the very thing they are allegedly intended to prove. Fortunately, this story has a happy ending. Global concern about anthropogenic global warming has dwindled steadily since 2009, and it's likely to decrease further as the nearly two-decade hiatus in global temperature change becomes more widely known. In most countries, global warming already scores last in lists of voter concerns. In opinion polls, the American people express doubt that global warming is primarily man-made or any kind of a problem. The polls demonstrate support for climate mitigation policies is waning, as do recent election results. Currently, there is no political support for anything more than token actions. As a result of all this, the Trump administration and the Republican-controlled Congress are taking steps to roll back the Obama administration's aggressive climate change policies. Our panelists will discuss the mistakes of recent climate policy and offer their suggestions for further reform. You can read their biographical sketches in the program guide, but I'll give you a brief excuse me, introduction of each. Uh, Dennis Hedke is a partner in Hedke Sanger Geoscience Limited and a former Kansas State Senator. So he's been there at the front lines while the federal government has been telling everybody what to do. Scott Armstrong is a professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and a founder of the Journal of Forecasting, International Journal of Forecasting, and International Symposium on Forecasting. Jay Lair is the science director of the Heartland Institute and a leading authority on groundwater hydrology. He also is, as many of you may have heard this morning, one of the people who's responsible for the existence of the Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> now I give you Dennis Hedke. Well, good afternoon, and I think we're getting a little possible feedback. Maybe tone that down a little bit. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to give my deepest thanks to Heartland Institute for putting this all together, and then 
for inviting me here to speak uh, among very esteemed colleagues at the table. Uh, it's been a, a joy getting to, to visit with them as we got this pulled together over the past few weeks, and uh, so I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, I'll get my, here we go, the other advance, there we go, thank you. <clears throat> I'm not supposed to be first, you're supposed to be first. Yes, so uh, okay. I, I'm sorry. Yes, it, let, uh, it makes a little difference later, so I'm just going to, here you go. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, is that Minipik charged against me? Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, that's me. I've been working on forecasting problems, trying to apply, make forecasting a science. And I've been doing that for about 57 years, and I've met a bunch of other people interested in the same thing. The statisticians have recently hijacked our, uh, well, I won't go into that. Um, I also have a uh, side business. Is there anybody from the New York Times here today? Uh, oh, because I, I want to dedicate this to New York Times. Um, we're a, a household that gets the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, so I read both of them. And they constantly say they want to, this is science is settled. We want it based on science. And I, I don't agree with the settled part. It's never settled. But I agree that uh, it should be based on science. I think we just have a little difference about maybe what science means. So I'm going to try to explain that. That's my side business. I've been working on, uh, I think I did my first paper about uh, science methodology in around 1970. <clears throat> I made up a lot of slides, uh, actually 33. You won't see all of them. Uh, I've withheld all the slides that relate to previous publications. But I wanted to give you a review of what's happened. And you will have the slides after the conference. You can go through, you'll go through the complete set if you'd like. Now this set, we'll get through hopefully in 20 minutes. If you went through the other set, I think maybe might go 20 hours. I'm not sure because I have all the evidence you need. If I say something, I'll tell you why I said it. You go look at the paper. You can see what other people said and so forth. Uh, I'll put most of my emphasis on uh, recent publications and uh, especially on forthcoming publications. So I don't think I'll have any time for questions during this. People versus climate change, you know, this isn't going to end. We still have a lot to do, and now there's all these court cases coming out about kids versus climate change, and uh, they're going to fight hard. So I think we have to have some methods in process to address this. You know, how can we show people are not following scientific methods? And um, I think Christopher Monckton set me up for a nice uh, end of this talk when he said, Ask Lamar Smith, if, are there any uh, guidelines, anything we could give to somebody? There are. They're one page long, and I've got copies for you at the back of the room. It's, uh, this is all about the future. So it's obviously a science problem, I mean, forecasting problems. I, I would testify about this at one of Lamar Smith's hearings, and uh, one of the Democrats said, well, uh, what do you know about climate science? I don't know anything about climate science. I'm, I'm, a for, I'm a forecasting guy, you know? So life is simple for me. Uh, I've got Willie Soon and Keston Green. They know a lot about science uh, of uh, climate change, but I'm the forecasting guy. So I want to summarize all this evidence, and maybe some of the others of you can think about the same thing. Get a complete summary of all you've done. Make it available. It's very convenient to put it in a PowerPoint and, and give people access to all the papers. And I'm trying to uh, set us up so we can fight all alarmist movements. It won't stop with uh, global warming. There'll be the, uh, the communists and the progressives and liberals will continue on to find things. So we have to have a procedure in mind. How do we nip this in the bud? What do we, we want to make it scientific in order to get something in as a regulation. So I'll talk to you about that. And there's a lot of people we want to contact. So I'm looking for you also, you know, to circulate these slides to people you know. Okay, that's pretty much, we're through with that one already. 
So uh, our long-term forecasts of dangerous global warming scientific. So I approached that in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, I only know of two papers that claim to follow scientific principles in making forecasts. Uh, the two are by, uh, well, uh, Willie Soon and Kessie Green and myself. And nobody's challenged that. Uh, you know, if they think there's something wrong, that's fine. I, I know Einstein, uh, there's this book I've started about Einstein's mistakes. I mean, he published a lot of mistakes. If you make a mistake, you fix it. So I'm happy with people doing uh, replications and letting me know that I'm wrong. I'm so wrong that I'm now working on version like 397 of the last paper I'm going to show you today. 397 versions, and we've been working on it for years, and it'll probably take me another 100. The IPC uh, methods violate 81% of the 89 forecasting principles. How many people can do their job, normal job, and violate you know, the way you're supposed to do it? These are principles of forecasting. These are the steps you should follow. If you look 100 years ahead, we did a lot of tests of predictive literally. We go back at some point and we forecast ahead year by year up to 100 years. If you take years 90 to 100, uh, the IPCC forecasts are, are 12 times larger than the forecast that we use, that I used also in the uh, bet with Al Gore, that it's, there's no long-term trend. Are they scientific? Uh, okay, only two papers. Next thing, uh, the uh, tests on other data sets. Uh, we'll pick any data set you have. We'll go and look at it, or we re recommend that other people do it. Um, we've gone to data sets that go back to 112 AD. It doesn't matter what data. We don't look at any particular period. We just take the whole data set, which is one of the principles of forecasting. If you've got data, use it all. Don't, uh, we get the same answer no matter what data set we use. So the global cooling hypothesis turned out to beat the global warming hypothesis in the uh, thing we did from uh, 12 AD, 112 AD. It was twice as accurate as the global warming process, uh, hypothesis. Also, no, because the, uh, it's not scientific because it ignores all of the golden rule of forecasting, which you don't know about yet, but I'll tell you shortly. And the uh, Armstrong, Green, and Soon forecast violated only one. It violates Occam's razor. You know, it should be a more complex it needs be. It fails to comply. We came up with eight criteria for science, which I'll show you later. It, it ties into what uh, um, Lamar Smith heard from Christopher Moncton today. Do you have a short list? This is our short list. Uh, it, compl it fails to comply with any of these scientific cr criteria. It fails to forecast well, what's the harm to people. You know, it assumes that. There's no scientific forecast that we could find. I keep putting out these challenges. It fails to provide any evidence that these solutions will work. You know, paint your roof white and things like that. Uh, it fails to meet the 11, the 10 necessary conditions for a regulation to be effective. That's part of the iron law of regulation, which I'll get to later. It's similar to 23 earlier environmental alarms that look similar to global warming and that were supported by the government and that all were wrong and all lost money. The golden rule of forecasting. What is the golden rule of forecasting? Uh, this is a paper that was published recently and uh, we noticed that certain interesting findings, like if you run regression analyses and then you're predicting, you can generally get a more effective prediction by converting all your prediction coefficients to a one called unit weights. Some of you might already know that literature. And you will get better forecasts on out of sample, you know, when you actually predict. You fit the data. So presumably if you know the important variables, you don't even bother with regression. You just put a one in for every one and sum up the numbers. 
That is more effective than regression analysis. It drives economists crazy because they keep talking about how to get effective estimators. So the golden rule of, uh, of forecasting is uh, use, use a cumulative knowledge to date. Be conservative. If you're not sure what's happening, uh, you, the precautionary principle is the exact opposite. It says that we don't know what's going to happen, so we got to do something. Well, it could be warmer. It could be colder, too, right? Uh, so the golden rule that we came up with, uh, 28 guidelines for may being conservative, it, it's a guideline. It can be used by non-experts. The guidelines came from 105 published studies. Uh, we go through the forecasting literature and found these studies. Uh, this is an astonishing one. I, you know, this is, I can't believe life when you're, this is heaven for a researcher. Generally, we do something and we, yeah, it's statistically significant. Well, that doesn't matter, but gee, it helps like two or three percent. If you take the average guideline you, uh, and you violate the guideline, you get a 40 percent penalty in accuracy. That's why this global warming thing uh, on the long term forecast is uh, 12 times larger than our no change forecast. Uh, applied to the IPCC scenario, the golden rule is. Uh, uh, we found that there were 20 of the golden rule checklist items that were relevant to forecasting climate change. And the IPCC violated all of them. The Armstrong, Green, and Soon model violated one. You can rate the models yourself. These are really simple checklists. I'll be passing out one at the end of the day, and you can take a look at it. Occam's razor, simple is better, uh, trace back to Aristotle and maybe before, who knows. It's survived for century. I don't see many scientists that disagree. Well, I ran across one that disagreed one time and then I had my go at him in the literature, but uh, that's, that's a well-established. But have you ever seen anybody test the predictive validity? How much will you save? Or, or do you really save? So we, we looked for them, couldn't find it, so we decided to do that. Uh, we had, uh, Non-experts rate how complex these models were. And it's s s amazingly simple. We ask people, you know, normal, well, actually students. I mean, they're better than normal, we're told. But um, they, uh, I, you have to answer these questions. And they all seem to be able to answer the question. Actually, we use Mechanical Turk a lot because you can hire people compared to students. They're more reliable. They do it quickly, and they do it with better quality. So Mechanical Turk, you know, I can send this out in a few days. I can get uh, these ratings. Um, could you describe each of these four things? And they rate it on a 1 to 10 skill. Now, that seems really crude, doesn't it? So we didn't hold out much hope for this. And we found 32 papers, 97 comparisons of the accuracy of simple versus complex. And mind you, the complex ones are usually from these statisticians that think they're going to improve the world with this complex approach. None of the papers found that complexity improved accuracy. And complexity increased the error by 27% on average. Astonishing. And you talk about complexity? Uh, People are uh, seduced by complexity. Analysts use these complex methods, and they can give the uh, client whatever they want. So you give me a bunch of data, uh, you let me analyze it however I like, and I can, I can deliver anything you'd like. <laughs> they're impressed. You ask them, if, if you give them a simple method, they think, I, I could have done that myself, you know? So they're not willing to pay much. So they're willing to pay a lot more when you make it complex. And yeah, I came across this thing by uh, T.C. Chamberlain, one of my real heroes in science. And uh, I, I was so excited, I went and told uh, Willie about this. And I said, and also, he was in climate science. Oh, yeah, he says, Willie says, I knew that. <laughs> Willie seems to know everything about climate science. So that's, that's a pretty interesting uh, quote there by uh, T.C. Chamberlain from the 1890s. Simple forecasting checklists, ratings, IPC um, ratings of compliance, 
with Occam's razor. They scored 19%. Uh, the no change model scored 96%. The ratings, most of the ratings I give you, most of the checklists, uh, top out at about an hour. And if you have some experience with me, you can get them down to 15 or 20 minutes. Now, is alarm, uh, is the uh, global warming alarm, it, that's another regulation. Uh, is it consistent with the iron law of regulation? If it is, we've got our first exception. The iron law of regulation is, uh, you can read it right there. That's what it says. We, we didn't invent it, but Kessin and I thought it needed a lot more attention, so we started a website called theironlawregulation.com. We started, invited people to say, you know, maybe some regulations will work. Send us ones that work, and we'll find under what conditions, and that'd be a good way to develop new ones that work. We get zero, zero responses. Uh, we searched literature, asked experts, and established the evidence. Um, we established this website to uh, identify the necessary conditions for a successful regulation. We came up with 10. And to provide evidence on whether regulation works or not, it always fails so far. Uh, to provide techniques so we can forecast what's going to happen. Uh, we've, we've come up with a couple of methods that the uh, the military was interested in the uh, CIA of uh, structured analogies and simulated interaction, which allow us to predict the outcome, the decisions made in complex conflict situations. And uh, it was a tough sell. People in the uh, CIA, they like stories. They like stories. So, uh, uh, and we had evidence. They didn't like evidence either. Uh, uh, we could provide a checklist for seeing which uh, regulations are uh, in need of revision. We could use the checklist for that. We can uh, uh, report regulations that are uh, outrageous outcomes. Does it have the, uh, this is the ratings there, the uh, compliance uh, of IPCC. Keston rated it and I rated it. We, didn't, we, we had almost a zero for it. He gave him a 10. He wasn't sure. We, we usually do it independently, then we talk it over, you know. So, <coughs> Relying only on scientific research, the scientific method has to uh, replace advocacy with the uh, scientific method. So you'll have a paper on guidelines for science. Uh, the checklist, I have a copy here. There's copies at the back. You can usually uh, fill those out in a few minutes uh, if you're trying to uh, rate a particular scientific paper. What does it mean to say compliance is science? Well, think about uh, regulations or scientific papers you've read. Uh, one tip, uh, we, we also go through journals and rate papers on how well they conform to the scientific method. And I used to think about maybe 10% of the papers in my field and other social sciences were maybe useful. Uh, and then now it looks like maybe one-tenth of 1%. One I mean, uh, people just, they don't do it. They don't follow the scientific method. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. The, the scientific method is we have to be objective, have useful findings, have full disclosure methods, comprehensive review of knowledge, valid and simple methods, experimental evidence, and conclusions that are consistent with the evidence. We, we were working on the, uh, for example, with full disclosure, we were working on the polar bear forecast, and we found that uh, we, would send them, uh, we were asked to review the government's polar bear forecast. And we said, could you send us the data? And they wrote back and said, no. They said, well, well why not? Oh, we're using it. Uh, so we had to do it without knowing what the data were. Willie got the data for another place. Uh, are the IPCC scenarios consistent with compliant with science? You can make your own ratings. 
They have high inner radar reliability. I, we're using them currently, or at least I am, to uh, select uh, applicants to the PhD, uh, people looking for jobs as assistant professors uh, at our place. Uh, I use that rating. I'm trying to convince the whole department. I have a very supportive department head, and uh, he's supportive in this movement. I'm trying to convince others to try. And it seems to have a big effect. When I give my uh, ratings of compliance to science, this seems to affect the votes in the department. Oh, yes, why? Why is this all happening? Why don't they do the scientific together? Nobody asks them. You know, you, you send something to a journal, they don't tell you what you have to do. They hire somebody to be a researcher. They don't say, here's what science is and want you to do it. I can get people from Mechanical Turk to follow this. But if I give them, a, you know, say, follow these rules, and they'll do it because I pay them. It's easy to do. Commitment is easy to do. If you say, this is your job, you're supposed to follow science. If you don't, then we'll find somebody else that will. Um, what can I say here? Why, why don't they follow science? And also, nobody, besides nobody asks them, they're rewarded for doing, un can I have like three more minutes? Okay. <laughs> uh, so they're not asked. Where's, they're rewarded for doing non-scientific research. One of my favorite examples is st statistical t uh, test of statistical significance. Gotta get that working here. Uh, that's invalid. It's been over 100 years we've been fighting the fight against that. And uh, it's simply invalid. Even the inventor thought it wasn't going to amount to anything. Student was his name to the gossip. Right? Uh, you get rewarded then for following an invalid thing. So how do they handle that? Well, they cheat. You know, if they don't get statistically significant results, then you, you know, throw out variables, add variables, do, you know, and eventually you get what you want. Uh, in some journals, 100% of all quantitative papers have to ha have statistical significance, have to. Uh, my big thing is uh, advocacy. People are asked to come up with certain answers. And our whole field, that's been a general movement ever since I've been there, just gets worse every year. And the reason is funded research. I, I'm proud to say that I actually tried in the future, but I couldn't get anything. Julian Simon said, they'll never give you a grant anyways. So I've done my whole career with lots of publications, and I have never gotten a, a research grant. And I'm proud of that now. Uh, <laughs> it leads to advocacy. It leads to complex writing because reviewers, and there's a fascinating research on that. They even have a, uh, papers that are written by computer. They put in typical words, and then they create sentences out of them, and then they submit them to journals and they get accepted. There was a big ruckus a few years ago, about 100 papers had to be removed from one of the journals. Uh, advocacy is my main thing that we've got to overcome. And the best way to do that is, as the greats said, and uh, it goes back many years, uh, the government has no business in research. Maybe research in killing people, because they don't do, like to do that in the free market. You don't like to go around designing things to kill people. Maybe you can do research there. but. In trying to create a better life, government has no role to play in science. Oh, they put irrelevance uh, words in there, like uh, anything that happened to do with uh, the brain. All right, so, and we have all these irrelevant things, like how many citations do you have, or how many papers? That's ridiculous. The only thing you're interested in is, what have you discovered? That's what Benjamin Franklin, that's why he founded the University of Pennsylvania. He said, there are two things you have to do. One is to do use, find useful knowledge and then disseminate it. And right now we have a new one. I'm not going to say what it is. What should we ask your regulators? Comply with the science. Audit it. Don't just tell them to fill it out. Audit it and make sure they follow it. Uh, and dismiss those that fail to comply. Reject and revoke compliant regulations. Require scientific evidence for all. Uh, I love the work done by the Institute for Justice. They find things that are really ridiculous that everybody, no matter what your party said, uh, and they say, uh, we'll fight this case. If we lose, maybe that's good because then it'll go to the Supreme Court and we'll win there. 
Uh, they've lost only uh, one Supreme Court decision so far, and that was the uh, little pink house, uh, forget the, Keo, Keo case, yeah. So that's a good strategy we could try. Charles Mary's, uh, it, yeah, I'm glad I got this. This is uh, Charles Mary's, just a wonderful book he, uh, by the people, and he's proposing the Madison Fund. The company spent a lot of money to prepare for the inspections. The Madison Fund would um, insure people again. So the companies would pay for insurance for this. And if you get, as long as you're doing the right thing, don't worry. If the government comes along with a regulation and they think you didn't do it right, well, they're going to get fought by the Madison Fund. They'll be, if they did it wrong, then the, Madison, you know, the insurance company doesn't uh, invite you. Like if you actually run over somebody, your, your plan doesn't help you with your automobile. Ah, okay, action steps, there's a bunch of them. Uh, maybe you can get out, send this out to a bunch of people, and I'm out of here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you, Scott. I uh, look forward to seeing the iron law of regulation spread. All right. And uh, as a legislator, I'm going to go ahead and yield my time to Jay. I'm just, just kidding. Uh, all right. Well, it's great to be back with you. Uh, we're going to be talking about regulations, federal especially, uh, and the impact that it's having on America and households um, and businesses, certainly across our land. Uh, I'll show you a couple of case histories of things that have really happened, and uh, we'll go on from there. Uh, there we go. Okay, our friends at the EPA, the antithesis of cost-benefit analysis. Uh, we wish that they would have taken some steps to try to improve their cases, but that's just not going to happen in, in terms of the historic administrations. We do hope that uh, Administrator Pruitt will change that picture dramatically and successfully for all Americans. So there's a 2016 uh, conference spending report that they put out, and it was dated January 31st of this year. And there's just a quick look at, at what that did and what that meant. Uh, there was, back in September of 16 in Cincinnati, uh, those attending on EPA's dime incurred average expenses of $2,226 per person over the three-day span, or about $750 a day, all to gain a better understanding of regulatory and compliance challenges that confronted the states that they put on the states. Think about that. You're going to hear, uh, after me, Dr. Lair give you some, some morsels to really consider in terms of where we can head in this country to improve conditions in our regulatory environment, uh, especially with respect to the EPA. And it's certainly my opinion, and I think a lot of people agree with me, that the states, all 50 of them, are eminently capable of managing most of their own affairs with respect to their air and water environments. They've been doing a great job, and I think it's certainly time for the EPA federally to back off and to restructure itself materially. So uh, as Jay shares his plan, I just want you to really contemplate the value of a new philosophy that could become involved at that federal level and really, really migrate most of the responsibilities back to the states. The uh, George Mason University Mercatus Center here in Washington, D.C. has done some, I think, very interesting work with respect to evaluating regulations and the impacts uh, in the United States uh, back activity areas. And that map you see there, all 50 states have been ranked with respect to the impact on their regulatory environment. The state of Kansas is 12th worst in the country. And you're gonna see some evidence about the poor state of Louisiana, which ranks first worst, and the impact that it's had on their businesses. And uh, so we'll sh show you that slide here in a moment. That's a simple little curve that demonstrates where we have gone since 1970 in this country. That's not just the EPA, that's all sorts of regulatory uh, add-ons that, that uh, have impacted Americans, and now we're just about 1.2 uh, 
million regu regulatory restrictions that, that have greatly impacted our businesses and our lives. Kansas top five industries restrictions are summarized in that graph. And you see the, the one that really won out there, so to speak, if you want to call it winning, is the group of professional scientific and technical services. Now you might not look at Kansas and think, oh, there's all kinds of technology and that's what it's famous for, but think about this. Boeing, Spirit, Cessna, Learjet, were the air capital of the world in Wichita, Kansas only. And so there's a lot of technology focused in just that county uh, and, and region. And then you have Kansas City, you've got the world headquarters for Sprint, you've got uh, Garmin Industries manufacturing all the GPS things that you, not all the GPS things, but some of them that you could be using. So there is a fair amount of uh, opportunity for improvement in the regulatory environment across that, that piece, certainly. In Louisiana, uh, if you've been to the Gulf Coast, and many of you probably have at some point or another, you've certainly seen in New Orleans and other facilities in that region, the material uh, installations with respect to chemical manufacturing and, and the, the lifeblood for that region. Of course, that's linked to the oil and gas industry. The offshore industry is focused out of, of New Orleans. And, and so there you go, over 65,000 regulations that, that relate to chemical products and manufacturing and oil and gas came in second. Oil and gas extraction, about 14,000. McLaughlin Shearhouse, that's Patrick and McLaughlin and Oliver Shearhouse at Mercatus Center produced this uh, interesting summary and uh, uh, notice that at the very top, petroleum and coal products manufacturing and electric power generation, transmission and distribution add up to more than 46,000 regulations that they get to deal with on a daily basis and, and the mag magnitude of extra responsibility that, that that certainly has put on them and compare that to the bottom of the list, Big Pharma, the 11,500 regulations that they get to deal with. I don't know how that came about, but I guess because you would think that our health would matter and that the way that the, F, the various federal organizations would relate to that would be maybe a little bit larger number in comparison to those others. Uh, finally, on this series, uh, we've got sources of regulations for wholesale trade. And I guess there's no surprise who leads the pack on that set of regulations. And, and that kind of surprised me when you look down at the very near the bottom of the list, the IRS coming in at a mere 749. I'm thinking, my gosh, the IRS, they're the biggest impact on a big part of my life, but they are way off scale, lower by a factor of 10% of what, what you got for the EPA's input. So. Let's hope that we can change that soon. I say enough is enough. There is some real endangerment out there. I was just reading before I left to come to the conference about uh, energy transfer partners uh, hope for uh, initiation of oil flow through the Dakota Access Pipeline. And reports were that the night before that there had been uncovered evidence of tampering with surface installations, most of the pipelines are underground, but with respect to some of the surface installations that were gated and locked, they found evidence that somebody had come into the pipeline and put, used a blowtorch to put a hole in one of the pipelines. And can you imagine the magnitude of potential damage that that could have occurred if they hadn't seen it in advance before they opened the flow, they were ready to go. But they're doing some final inspections and there were more than one of those instances. So there's a reason for states to take actions to prosecute and to take, take uh, whatever measures are necessary to protect the American people against insurgencies like what we did experience at the Dakota Access Pipeline before they finally got the thing really finally permitted and, and going forward. It's serious business, so some of the states are, are recommending fines of up to $100,000 per person and jail time up to seven years if you get caught. Now a lot of those folks are going in with masks and you can't see them. So you can't be, they can't be identified. So some states are actually saying, we want to be able to make sure that we can identify you so you will not be allowed to wear masks and do the things that you've been doing to try to upset balances in these, these uh, installations. So, and there are eight states, Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, North Dakota, Virginia, and Washington State that have introduced legislation and one of them has already failed so far this year. Okay, sustainability and climate change 
Those are just a few of the federal agencies, departments, that have headline mantras that speak loudly and clearly to their intent to disseminate the damage to our climate that we're doing and that we've got to stop somehow because of uh, the movements that are supporting them. Um, and this is by no means comprehensive. You got 400 American universities that many of them are federally funded who are also at the front lines trying to defend this indoctrination that the United States of America has been suffering for the last 40 years. And I think we need to do something about that. Maybe we need to take some money away from the universities. Here's the Department of Interior, one example. <clears throat> Climate change, this is a website shot from this week. This is still out there. Now, I wanna applaud Secretary Zinke for beginning to take some steps that need to be taken to reroute that agency because Interior has a very big impact. U.S. Geological Survey is a part of that. And uh, you know, it, it matters to Americans that they do things right. And there is responsibility, they have a large uh, responsibility area in the, in the Gulf of Mexico installations and, and activities that occur down there, and they've, they've regulated that uh, substantially. I say the U.S. Department of NOAA, also known as the Department of Commerce. I say that because the budget for NOAA, fiscal year 2017, is 9.7 billion, just under 10, and their share of NOAA's share of that budget is 5.8 billion. 60% of the, the Department of Commerce's budget is focused on NOAA. Now, maybe I'm just way off and thinking that that's a little too much for regulating our oceans and, and helping the whales do what the whales wanna do. I'm just saying. Impact of regulation in Kansas. Well, since 2009, um, the year that Kathleen Sebelius, somebody whose name you might remember, handed off the governorship to a guy named Mark Parkinson. And Mark Parkinson was negotiating a deal with a company in western Kansas called uh, Sunflower Electric Power Company, one of the larger distributors of electricity in, in western Kansas, electricity that could go to Colorado to other nearby states and what have you. And they were, they had a permit, but the uh, legislature was not quite ready to release the privilege of their expanding, their desired expansion of that Sunflower Electric Power Plant by a factor of about two. And, and so at the end of the day, the deal got cut between Mark Parkinson and Sunflower Electric Power Company that would allow them to expand, but they would have to just casually introduce in the Kansas legislature mandates for renewable power which in Kansas means wind. So the deal was cut. 10% renewable capacity by 2011, 15% by 2015, and 20% by 2020. And so the legislation passed, and shortly thereafter, the Secretary of Health and Environment said, well, that permit wasn't good enough. Uh, we need to go back and re revisit that, so you're gonna have to answer some more questions. They went back and they reconstructed the permit and it was approved. But then we had our friends from the Sierra Club and all sorts of other organizations put lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit on Sunflower's desk. And today, 2017, they're still not started with, with reconstruction of that and expansion of that power plant. I would just say that the legislature exhibited a clear violation of the iron law and if they had something like that in front of them to consider that they might have thought twice about the magnitude of the regulations and whether the cost benefit analysis would really be a fit for the state of Kansas. <clears throat> this is a record of my electricity consumption since 2009, late 2009 to January of this year. I just want to point out a couple things. The blue dots, and there's a gap in there because my wife lost some records and I didn't have a chance to go back and find them. But but the blue dots uh, are on a trend that increased, that's a uh, total cost per kilowatt hour for heating and cooling my home, and it went up 50% since the end of 2009, 50%. Uh, 
Uh, the yellow trend is transmission cost per kilowatt hour. That's over 100% increase in price since 2009. Now, Westar would try to tell you that the red line down there was the most expensive part of their going forward with their business model because that's where the environmental costs came in. They had to pay them or they would be fined and so forth. But you can see with your own naked eye that the environmental costs at the end of the day became relatively minimal. Okay, energy.gov. Rick Perry's there. Uh, there's the web shot, climate change at the very top of it. Uh, that department in the past has aided and abetted the war against fossil fuels probably as much as any other agency besides the EPA. And I do hope that we've got some opportunity in the future to see that materially changed and then I'll be certainly encouraging Secretary uh, Perry to do that. Um, this is kind of my favorite one. I'm going to give you a little bit more insight. As a uh, Chairman of Energy and Environment Committee in the Kansas House, I was a member of the Energy Council. Uh, and so we were invited to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, summer of 2015, to uh, hear a, a presentation uh, that was sponsored by Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, specifically Dr. Terry Wallace. You can see his credentials there. Uh, Principal Associate Director of Global Security at Los Alamos. And he started sharing some very interesting facets of what they look at and what they manage and some big responsibilities, globally speaking. And I was, I was impressed with the first five minutes of his 45 minute talk. And then he quick, quickly drifted into <coughs> sustainability, climate change, and the risks that all that poses on American citizens. And we've really, really got to watch that. He made the comment that, that uh, by 2030, the oceans of the world are going to be fished out. And he started talking about the 9 billion people that were also going to be populating the planet by 2030. And, and all the, the, the risks with that increased population are inability to feed the people. And, and uh, I sat on my hands and there were 50 or 60 legislators and their wives and spouses listening to this. And I just kind of looked around the room watching the reactions and oh my, people were, you know, this is terrible. You know, we're, polar bears are going to, you know, all disappeared, all that stuff. Well, I, I had to write him a letter, and so that's the header for the letter. But when he's talking about the nine billion people, no way to feed them, no way to, there's no space. I just said, well, you know, if you just think about this, I gave him a little image of spreading your arm out six feet in that direction as far as you can go, and then space the, the next row out same distance. Uh, with that kind of a spacing, uh, and I had heard prior to that that you could fit the entire globe's population inside the state of Texas. And I thought, is that right? Uh, well, if you do the math just on what it just showed you there, that's 3.6 percent of the state of Texas spread out 95 miles by 95 miles. That's the rectangle that would encase the entire global population at that spread. Now that'd be about an eight and a half foot hypotenuse. You probably wouldn't want to sleep there too long if, you, if that's all the space you had. But that's theoretically you know, what's involved here. If you took those nine billion people and spread them out across the entire state of Texas, every person would get 1.6 acres to do what they need to do. And that's just Texas, which is 0.3% of the globe's land surface area. So that was one thing. Um, I had to send him one graph. The blue, the blue shaded area represents the oscillation, monthly average temperature in the United States of America. This is NOAA data. This is no, nothing's manipulated. This is just what it is. And I think you can see from 1895 on the far left part of that graph over to approximately present day, really it was 2011, but things haven't materially changed in that time frame. Um, that the black dots CO2 concentration in that same time frame has, we've seen this many times, the trend is dramatically upward. But the, the monthly temperatures, and I think I can, up there, the, the maximum daily temperature occurred in 1936, Dust Bowl days in Kansas, okay? Minimum temperature is January 
1979. So those are the hard data facts about temperature and CO2 concentration, which would scare Dr. Wallace. There's a correlation you can trust. Global population, same time frame. There's a 95% correlation coefficient between global population and CO2 concentration. Everybody's breathing, thank God. And they need to keep doing that. Okay, President Trump's desire to cut 25% out of the EPA's budget, I think is just wonderful. And I hope he can go further. But at the very bottom of that list, notice those two items, environmental education and environmental justice. What has that done for America? What in the world has that done for America, other than influence other countries to be more belligerent and, and opposed to fossil fuel delivery and cheap energy, which is what America and the world needs, and it's just so sad. Second page, uh, just a few more things that, that are focused. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the details there, but, but hopefully most, if not all, of those items that he has identified for excision or serious adjustment will actually occur. I just have a couple of conclusions that I would pose. I would say that we must aggressively trim and restructure and eliminate multiple programs within the federal system that have any association with the God of sustainability, which is where climate change came from, and especially in starting with the EPA. And secondly, it's incumbent upon us to strive to deliver the truth to the American people with good science, properly constructed legislation, and policy making that is grounded in the iron law of regulation. That's all I've got. Thank you. Got the clicker, which I won't be using. Uh, no. I'm going to tell you a couple interesting stories to uh, loosen you up a little bit and then trace the history of where we are and why we are. Uh, one just little anecdote is uh, raise your hand if anybody here has read the 70 year old Sinclair Lewis novel. Aerosmith. A few of you have. Well, uh, Scott Armstrong and I found out that that book guided our entire life in science. If you uh, read a novel a year, go back 70 years and, and uh, find out how science uh, drives a true scientist, something we see uh, uh, very few of, and I think you'll uh, enjoy it. But it was interesting in chatting with Scott that both our lives were dramatically influenced by a simple novel about a, uh, a doctor whose life uh, was dedicated to uh, ultimately to research as ours have been. Uh, the second uh, little story you may or may not know is uh, you heard Scott talk about Occam's razor and probably everybody here has heard the term and they have a general idea what it is. But the, the term razor uh, used century, Occam is someone who lived uh, centuries ago and a razor back in ancient times was basically a theorem, a truism that you might have, uh, for instance, in uh, geometry. And my favorite uh, Occam razor story, you will not soon forget this, uh, is that if you're walking in a farm field here in the United States and you hear hoofbeats behind you, make the assumption that it's horses and not zebras. <laughs> well, uh, many of you know that I'm a very serious skydiver. I hold a world skydiving record for stupidity. I, I didn't miss a single month a few years back, went 34 years and 11 months without missing a month of skydiving. Well, one day I went out of a plane, this is about five years ago, I went out of a plane at uh, 13,000 feet and I uh, I misread the ground in terms of where I went out of the plane. I misread the winds, and I landed about five miles from where I was hoping to land in a farm field, and I heard hoofbeats behind me. And I turned around, and it was zebras. Uh, <laughs> honest to God, it really, 
It was a farmer that had wild animals, but I'll, I won't forget that as long as I live. I want to trace for you the uh, history I heard. Dennis mentioned 1895. Our whole problem began in, 1980, in 1895 when Savanti Arrhenius, a European uh, scientist, uh, determined that carbon dioxide does indeed have an impact on uh, temperature, that it absorbs heat, and uh, therefore it was a greenhouse gas. Uh, actually, in his writings, Savanti Arrhenius felt that was a wonderful thing, and uh, warmth was a very positive uh, factor in our lives, which, of course, it is. Uh, in case you haven't checked, we're now fairly sure that nine times more people die prematurely from cold uh, than from heat. And it was, if you were in the economic uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, you know, mentioned uh, while he was calculating the social cost of carbon dioxide, uh, he was quite sure, as I am, that we will be facing uh, colder weather in the coming decades, which will be more of a problem. However, we'll adapt. Uh, we will we'll work it out. Uh, the next major date of where we're going was 1980, 1990, when IPCC formed a committee of the United Nations not to study climate change, not to determine why the climate changed, but entirely to determine man's role in warming the planet. That was their directive. That's all they've ever done. It was never an open uh, scientific thing. And they ignored from the outset that carbon dioxide was much higher in, in centuries and thousands of years past, and it had no impact on slowing the ice ages that we have uh, experienced. They started building these uh, mathematical models that have only disagreed with each other, have never been able to predict the future or even predict backwards in the past when we had all the data. It's those IPC reports that really developed the concept of consensus science. There is no such thing as consensus science. It is insane to think that you can vote that something is correct. Einstein, a, a bunch of scientists uh, wrote a book. I can't remember who published it, but the title of the book was 100 Scientists That Disagree with Einstein. Einstein responded in saying it, it would only take one to disagree if he could prove that. By the way, you're probably looking at the only person you will ever meet from now on who actually knew Albert Einstein. I was joking this morning that I was around when the dinosaurs were here. Uh, I, I was, of course, but I actually had a nodding acquaintance with Albert Einstein. Pretty much every morning, uh, he went up the sidewalk to uh, work in his laboratory at Princeton, and I went down the sidewalk uh, to, to class. When I say we had a nodding acquaintance, that was it. I nodded, he nodded. And, and <laughs> but it's still exciting. It, it's still exciting to me. Now, global warming is like so many other things that we faced in history. Uh, it may shock you that a doctor by the name of Semmelweis a couple hundred years ago could not convince doctors when they moved from the morgue to the birthing room to wash their hands. And something called purple fever was common uh, with women uh, giving birth. It took 20 years for him to convince the doctors to wash their hands. It took Louis Pasteur 50 years to convince medical science of the germ theory, the, the, the theories of how disease was passed uh, really insane historically. Now, we've already talked about how we got to get rid of the endangerment uh, situation. We need a new EPA. We have to withdraw uh, from Paris. Um, we're, right now, we're facing Robert Kennedy Jr. wants to try everybody in this room for war crimes. That's a fact. Uh, Leonard, Leonardo DiCaprio, who is a high school dropout, is now teaching science to the federal government. I mean, that's where we are. But it, it, it really started with, uh, with good intent. Um, and as I said 
or, or mentioned, maybe I said it this morning, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I did say it with regard to Senator Inhofe. Uh, I am largely responsible with four other people. There were five of us, the other four probably aren't alive now or they're retired, but they're not active, surely, for developing the whole concept of uh, EPA from 68 to 71. Uh, we succeeded, as you know, Nixon signed the law for an EPA. Uh, in 1971, and it was really not a bad agency uh, to begin with. We passed seven laws that I think are all on the screen in the 70s, and I, I actually had played a role in writing them all. They were sensible. I testified before Congress in the 70s uh, a couple dozen times trying to explain uh, what environmental problems were, whether it was air pollution or surface water pollution or groundwater pollution. Uh, or, or mining uh, problems, or agricultural chemical problems, uh, the, the Congress had no clue, no clue. So we lectured to them, and we were able to get seven laws that were really quite good. The only law that wasn't quite good <coughs> was the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act that you all know is Superfund. That law ran off the uh, rails in about 1980. Since 1980, I can tell you there has not been a single environmental law passed that advanced the cause of environmental protection in the United States. And at that point, the Environmental Protection Agency became a wholly owned subsidiary of the green movement. I mean, it was truly weaponized against society. And it remains that way today. Uh, hopefully, Scott Pruitt will uh, move it in the right direction. It won't be easy. It's hard to get rid of federal employees. If I had my druthers, I would uh, have every, all 15,000 of the people working in Washington and in the 10 districts come in and talk to me for five minutes. I would certainly fire 90% of them based on my five-minute interview with them. But that isn't going to happen. It's going to be a slow uh, process. Um, within uh, EPA, there are 14 offices. I'm going to show you all of them. Two of them, read them. Do, do those two offices belong in EPA? Who runs the, uh, our, our work with Indian tribes in the United States? What's the name of it? The Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA. Why are those two offices not in the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Well, let me go back a little further. Uh, many of you know that uh, uh, two years ago I wrote a plan uh, to devolve EPA over a period of five years and turn over all the responsibilities to a committee of the whole of the 50 states, which you heard Dennis uh, mention. Um, I initially wrote that plan, or began to write the plan for Romney, but the politicians got involved and just totally destroyed it. Uh, two years ago in Las Vegas, I'd been working on it for years. I was to be a keynote speaker at the end of a two-day session, and all the speakers before me were just amazing. And I had written a pretty much plain vanilla speech. And I was concerned that I was going to really come off looking bad uh, to the audience that had heard four great speakers, as we're hearing here. And uh, I said, I've got I've to do something different. And uh, my friend uh, Dick Geyer was sitting with me, a classmate. And I said, Dick, do you think I dare uh, talk about my plan to get rid of EPA? And uh, he said, sure, go for it. So I asked Joe Bast on the way out of the room that afternoon. I was going to keynote the next morning. I said, Joe, do you know what I'm talking about tomorrow morning? He said, no. I said, do you care? He said, no. <laughs> well, uh, that gave me uh, the license to talk about it. And then later on, I met Nancy Thorner, who's sitting in the front row. And I told her about what I was doing. And she said, go for it, because I was kind of scared. And I presented the plan, which now everybody in Congress and all the states has a copy of it. And the fascinating thing about it is that there has never been a criticism. I'm going to kind of show it to you very quickly in the last next few minutes. But there's never been a criticism of the plan in terms of this isn't practical or you can't do that. Not one. Uh, th th people just say it'll never happen. You don't get rid of federal agencies, and that may or may not be True, but the only criticism was it's a five-year plan, the idea not to throw people out of work on the street without you know, reasonable notice. And the only criticism is, why can't you do it in a year? Why do you need five years to get rid of EPA? Well, because I'm a, a nice guy, and, and I don't want to throw people out of work. I want to give them uh, a chance. And so here are 
There are 14 offices, each with their own budget, their own manpower. You just saw two of them, the two Indian groups. Do you think any of these offices that have large manpower and large budgets do any science? They're all administrators. They do no useful work whatsoever. So over the five years, we get rid of a couple of them at a time, giving them chances to find uh, new jobs. And we form, I uh, actually, I wanted to form <coughs> the new office of EPA in Topeka, Kansas, because it's a geographic center. Dennis worked in Topeka for a long time, said, no, it's a horrible place to put EPA. So we're looking for a Midwest town. All of the, the basically, most of the cabinet positions in our government should not be located in Washington. Uh, if you deal with uh, HUD and housing and urban development, it ought to be in Detroit. It ought to be where the problems are. And uh, if you're in Washington, the lobbyists just run everything. They run roughshod over you. So I think EPA should be moved into the middle of the country, and it should become an, a, a committee of the whole. And the plan was that each state would contribute six employees, giving 300 employees. Uh, their work would be divided up in accordance with the things that EPA has to do. And over a 10-year period, because it would take 10 years, they would analyze every EPA regulation. Those that were actually congressional laws, they would say it's good or bad or indifferent and send a recommendation back to the Congress. Those which are executive orders, which are 80% of what controls our environment, they would have the right, as our president now is doing, getting rid of things by executive order, they'd have the right to get rid of them by a two-thirds vote of the 50 states. Uh, the budget, let's go down. Those are the only, agent, the only offices doing science. And all of their work would be slowly, they would be phased out last in the last four to fifth year with the responsibilities going to various committees of the Committee of the Whole. And uh, they, would, they would rule over everything. It would take quite a while uh, to get it done. The budget for EPA is $8.2 billion. The manpower, 15,000. Essentially, everybody could be eliminated, except for the research. They have a few research labs that could still operate. Uh, they may take up uh, a little bit of money perhaps a billion dollars. And a billion dollars in grants would be given to the 50 states. $20 million would go to each state to uh, you know, allow them to send six people to the new office in the center of our country and to beef up the work they're doing. They do 100% of the work. I'm going to show you the only project I'm familiar with that the federal government has done in recent years uh, in a moment. There it is. There it is. The, uh, the EPA does nothing. They do no useful work. They just look over the shoulder and make life miserable for the states. But uh, last year, there was a, a break of a, of a barrier uh, and a mining operation that uh, uh, allowed some pollution to escape. And I don't know how it happened, but the federal government puffed out their chest, and we're going to send the feds in, and we're going to take it over from the Colorado Environmental Protection Agency. And that was the result. They had a little p pollution. They contaminated the Animus River uh, for well over a month. The EPA in its current form is useless. Uh, we've got to get rid of it. Now, do it in stages here. As I said, get rid of the Indian Affairs, uh, phase out the other groups uh, over time forming the Committee of the Whole. But the most important thing to understand is that it was really a great idea to form EPA originally. And why did we need it? The states did not have agencies. It took 10 years after the development of EPA and the writing of the seven laws I mentioned, it took 10 years for the states to take over what we call primacy, to take over the administration of all the, the new environmental laws that were, were definitely needed. But once every state had an EPA with a staff, with knowledge, to take over the responsibilities 
for administering all those laws, we, we have not needed a U.S. EPA ever since. I can argue we don't need a U.S. Department of Energy, we don't need a U.S. Department of Education. There are other lectures, but I'm sure there are people here that understand it's a similar, similar problem. It goes against the Constitution. Constitution called for four agencies, a cabinet of four. We needed a treasury, we needed a state department, uh, we needed a military, and I can't think of the fourth. Most of you probably will. Okay, uh, that was it. Well, so ever, essentially every agency of the federal government which took away power from the states was against the Constitution, not intended by the Founding Fathers. We're suffering for it ever since. I'm incredibly optimistic. I was amazed that I didn't get a single giggle this morning when twice I referred to Trump's eight years in office. <laughs> I'm very confident that at the end of eight years, uh, things are going to be a hell of a lot better with regard to every single department of the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we have some time for questions. So uh, please make sure to identify yourself and ask a question as briefly as possible, an actual question. My name is Alan Wissenberg. I reside in Germany. And Dr. Lea, you mentioned 1980. That's the year I left this country, been overseas, and I'm not here to defend anything that's going on in Germany <laughs> in any forum, but I think I have, I'm going to direct the question first to uh, Dr. Armstrong. When I left, I had an excellent education at the University of Illinois. Through good teachers, I understood the scientific method. I understood what peer review is. I'm a little concerned, and I'd like you to comment, without being a biochemist or a climate scientist directly, but a forecaster, do you think in eight years, plus or minus a year, we can reintroduce the concept of scientific method and peer review to the satisfaction of the people here? I, I'm worried. I don't think we can do it. It's not going to take eight years. We can do it all with checklists. They do it in lots of fields where we know the science. If you're going to do medical science, you have to use the checklist. And if you don't, more people die. We know that the checklists work. Uh, if you mandate it, if you hire people and say, we want, this is what we want you to do, they'll do it, or they're not lo there any longer. I can hire people. You know, I can ask my students to do something. They, they don't like to do it, but uh, if I ask, you know, Mechanical Turk, or I hire people, and I say, this is what I want to do, they do it. It's not a difficult thing. The only thing is, are we going to ask people? Why don't we tell people when we hire them, this is what a researcher does, you do it, and you're, you hang on. If not, you don't. I'm opt totally optimistic. I, I have little doubt we can do it in eight years. I think we can do it in, in, in a lot less. I think we can do it in minutes. Uh, I, no <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another question, and uh, we're going to go until around 5.15, if the panelists will consent. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, this question is for uh, Dr. Armstrong. Um, I'm a statistician myself, actually. Uh, my name is Kevin Dyerot, and I'm the senior statistician research, research program at the Heritage Foundation. Um, you know, you talked a lot about forecasting. I know you have extensive experience with that. Um, I was wondering if you had any comments on paleoclimatological reconstructions where backcasting occurs, and people try to essentially go backwards to forecast what temperatures were before there were any records and the process regarding that. It's not so much science in the same sense because yeah. they're not experiments that they're doing, but rather they might be manipulating data. I don't know, but yeah, do you have any comments on that? Perfectly reasonable thing to do. If you, uh, it's, it's done a lot of places, and it's an, uh, another way of testing out of, you're going out of sample. So that's what's important. So uh, it's in my uh, first book on forecasting, long range forecasting. They talk about backcasting, I call it. I'm the forecasting guy. I hardly even understand, you know, uh, what you're doing. <laughs> um, my name's Eric Worrell. I write for What's Up With That. Um, question is, uh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, how some uh, 
departments uh, or sort of small parts of agencies been obfuscated. So there appears, there's been accusations that it's been intentionally um, made difficult to sort of like root out all the climate activities of government. Uh, I'm wondering if what you guys' uh, impression is of this, uh, you know, if it is actually going to be difficult to identify some of these people. Time. Sorry. I'm not sure I understand. Sure. Um, I've read of several reports that uh, people who are actually doing climate work uh, for government agencies, uh, the, their job titles and what have you have been obfuscated to make it difficult to sort of like identify and, you know, root out those particular functions. I was wondering, you know, what, what your response is to that, if, if that's I, actually I have an not, issue. Uh, there clearly is going to be a reduction in people working for the government studying climate. I mean, the one thing I'm absolutely sure of is that uh, the Treasury Department is not going to be writing checks to, uh, for climate research across the entire government at the level they have in recent years, which to my knowledge is about $6 billion a year. Uh, so there's going to be a, a huge reduction and then they'll, the people whose titles involve climate are probably going to have to find work elsewhere. Uh, yes, hi, my name's Nicholas Lovesey. I'm one of the horrible lobbyists that try to run roughshod over with everything. <laughs> and uh, my question is, as far, the EPA's kind of an annoyance for my company, but things like the, uh, the lawsuit with Exxon are the kind of things that really sort of keep us up at night. Do you have any uh, policy or political question, uh, insights into things like that? Uh, I know the chairman who spoke at lunch. I mean, his committee's doing everything they can on that front, but... That I think the, the Exxon lawsuit is absurd. For those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, Exxon is being sued for covering up climate data. Like, they knew that uh, the development of fossil fuels was uh, uh, impacting climate in a negative way and the public will suffer. I think the lawsuit's absurd. I mean, they're suing them for something that Exxon could not possibly know, uh, the idea that they were, I can't say they weren't covering up stuff, but I can say anything they were covering up wouldn't hold water. Oh, my name is Jeff True. Uh, to what extent do you blame the Congress for abrogating its oversight uh, responsibilities to get us to where we are now with the EPA? And what's to say that when the Democrats come back in, they don't do um, uh, executive orders to put us right back where we are? I would answer 100% falls on the Congress, and there's nothing to say if the Democrats uh, get back in that we won't go back in that direction, but I'm just too optimistic. I think in, in, after eight years, uh, we're going to have a, a voting public that realizes their voice uh, is being heard. Uh, they're going to be uh, less frustrated with the government. I, I just, again, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, I can prove I'm the world's greatest optimist. You jump out of a plane every month for 40 years and you're, you're a little crazy and you're an optimist. But I really am optimistic that we're on a path that uh, we're not going to relinquish. I, well, Jay, I'm clearly, a little naive about this, but I thought uh, this is a, uh, the laws are supposed to be passed by Congress. I never understand in the first place how that changed, so it might go to the Supreme Court. And, and solve that one. That's absurd. Right. Clearly, to uh, implement your plan, Jay, it would have to go through Congress. It'd have to become a statute, and that would be much harder to turn around, except unless another Congress came and turned it around. Question Hi, uh, Steve Walsmack from Reality News. Um, the what are we what are we doing to eliminate the grants from EPA and others? Because this grant money is simply a transfer to to provide money to political to the green groups to provide the politics to keep them in place. So can, is, is there part of your plan, Jay in particular, or any of the other guys to uh, eliminate the ability of these agencies to provide grants to their political buddies? In my, in my plan, the states would be in control of, uh, of grant money and, and the collective of the 300 employees in the 50 states would, would make those decisions, as well as some at the various research labs. But frankly, I think that Scott Pruitt is going to be in charge of that. Uh, I would imagine he has the power as a new administrator of EPA uh, to oversee uh, all uh, grants. And many of them are, are valid, and, and there's a lot of good money going to states to do good things. 
But uh, he's in charge now, and I assume he doesn't have the power to fire everyone in EPA, which he probably should, but I think he does have the power to write the checks for grants. Question over there. Uh, uh, George Mears, I think you just hit on a very important topic. Is there, is there any appetite, you think, in, in, in Congress to come up with a bill that there's not a dime goes to any NGO without a two-thirds vote of both houses? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It's a wonderful idea. I mean, the, uh, the NGOs, you know, are, are, are part of the, uh, the green machine. And uh, it was brought up before that uh, EPA gives grants to organizations to sue them so they can, you know, do what they want to do. And uh, that has to end. I, I can't imagine a law like that going through, but I think uh, common sense is going to uh, improve the flow of money out of the federal government. Question up here. Hi, uh, James Morrison, uh, UBA again. Um, one of the concerns I have is what you're actually asking to do with the EPA is incredibly logical and reasonable. And that and politics don't go hand in hand. Um, the other concern that I have, and I, I know how the environmentalists and the lefties think, and that is that they will immediately turn around and say, what happens when the major oil companies and major fossil fuel companies have an accident? And the problem is, is the state just does not have the, fu the funding and the legal power to actually take them on and say, you need to clean it up because this was your responsibility, this was your land, this was your resource that you were, ex you were extracting. It made a mistake. And actually, if you're gonna create re legislation that says we're gonna regulate the environment, we're gonna make sure that it's done properly, you should also turn around and say to those companies, to a certain degree, you have a duty of care, not just to yourself, not just to the local environment, not just to the regional environment, but to the world, to clean up your mistakes because, hey, as an individual, I clean up my mistakes. So should companies. If they, if they have an accident, they should stand up and go out, okay, that went wrong. Let's try and do what we can to sort it out. Well, uh, I would think if, if a problem is of such a magnitude that you really have to go outside of your own state boundaries to get the funding to, to remediate and do what needs to be done, there probably is a need to have a federal uh, activity opportunity to, to look into and to manage those larger disasters. Deepwater Horizon, I mean, we hope nothing like that ever happens again, but, but you certainly couldn't put all that responsibility on the state of Louisiana, uh, for example, or Alabama, which is also on the Gulf Coast, or Texas. So there's probably some need to have some federal oversight uh, template that, that can reasonably respond to those larger problems that, that just go well outside of the ability of a state to, to handle it. So there's, there's a lot of work, I think, that would need to be done for us to really migrate Jay's idea into practical use. I applaud the idea. I'm, great, I'm very grateful that he spent the time to even think through it and try to get us into a, a new place. But as Sam pointed out, this is going to have to be a U.S. Congress uh, sanctioned alteration, and, and they're going to need to think hard and, and long about it, but I don't think it's out of the question for us to really change the picture, and it needs to happen. It really does need to happen, so thank you, Jay. There, there's a simple answer. Most every city I know has a rainy day fund. Some of you hear about a rainy day fund. I mean, it's a, a pot of money that you have to put to use uh, when something unforeseen happens, and I think Dennis is actually right, and that's a great question. I mean, clearly, there has to be a pot of money at the federal level uh, when the states, for the reasons that you uh, contemplate, just can't handle it. Most states also have rainy day funds and surpluses that they can dip into. And also we can't forget that there's the tort system, that when somebody commits a, 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 an incursion into someone else's property and destroys their property, they're liable for it. And uh, it's interesting that oftentimes they aren't held liable for it nowadays, and instead we go to regulators to say in the first place, well, you can't do X or Y because it might create an externality. What we should do is say, do what you want, 
but if it hurts somebody else's property, you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. And that is a much more sensible system. We have time for one last question. Get the last one. Uh, Roger Bezdak, question for Jay. Jay, you perhaps facetiously indicated that HUD should mo be moved to uh, Detroit. Uh, are you not naive enough to believe that if, if that was the case, all the lobbyists in Washington who lobby HUD would not also immediately move to uh, Detroit and perhaps even be more effective lobbying HUD in Detroit than they are in Washington? I think only half of them would move. <laughs> Life is soft in Washington, D.C., and uh, not so much in Detroit. You're, of course, right. There would be a movement, but I think uh, the pressure on uh, HUD in Detroit or, or some such city would be considerably less uh, than in Washington, D.C., because a lot of the lobbyists work for lobbying firms, and they, the people there uh, work with a half a dozen different uh, agencies. So, I mean, it is a concern, but I think it wouldn't be what you're implying. Yes, yeah, splitting up those firms could make them less efficient, which would be very nice. <laughs> Sam, could I what it, can I make one? Okay, yes, please. Uh, one comment about rainy day funds. <clears throat> State of Kansas statutorily requires a 7.5% ending balance every year. I was in the legislature for six years, and we reached that moment once. And prior to that time, I don't think it happened for 25 years. So the rainy day fund idea was floated in our legislature and, and, and you know, really attempted to be enforced, but we had tough budget times uh, every year that I was in the legislature, and uh, we had you know, one surplus out of that. So it's just a challenge, and I don't know the other states' situations, but uh, we got to figure it out. We're all grateful to the, you, the audience, for staying a little extra time and to our terrific panel for their expertise.